All right, the time is um, 6.32. Looks like people have gotten in. Um, whenever you're ready, Chris, I think you can take it away. All right, thanks, Kayla. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our live virtual public information meeting. My name is Christopher Cameron, and I'm the project manager for the proposed roadway reconstruction project on McGrath Highway, which is State Route 28 in Somerville, which we'll be discussing here tonight. I work in the major projects group within the project management section at the Massachusetts Department of Transportation's Highway Division headquarters in Boston. Uh, the purpose of the meeting is to provide a method for the Commonwealth to engage the public, furnish information concerning the state's construction proposals, and to give every interested resident of the area and the public an opportunity to provide input and feedback on the proposed project. Also, these meetings give the Commonwealth an opportunity to receive information and feedback from local sources, which is very valuable to the state in making decisions as the design progresses. First, we'd like to present some procedural elements of a virtual design public information meeting and review the functionality of the Zoom software. Kayla Sousa, one of our producers for this evening, will present that information. Kayla? Thank you, Chris. My name is Kayla, and I'm one of the MassDOT producers this evening, providing tech support and facilitating questions alongside Leah Gradstein. Let me take a moment to go over some Zoom basics. If you need to call into the meeting, you can call 301-715-8592 and use webinar ID 876-6284-0706. Zoom tech support can be reached at 1-888-799-9666. On the bottom left, you will find your audio controls. The chat function is disabled for this meeting, so please direct your written questions to the Q&A box. You can type questions at any time, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation, where we'll also allow participants to ask questions verbally. Please note that while Zoom provides automatic closed captions, they may not be entirely accurate. I would like to let everyone know that this public meeting is being recorded. All parts of public meetings are public record, so MassDOT can retain and distribute all parts of the meeting. If you type a question or ask one verbally, know that you will be a part of the record, so please use both functions for project-related business only. If you are not comfortable being included in these types of records, you can choose to just listen in today or excuse yourself from the meeting entirely. Again, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. All questions and comments are welcome. However, please refrain from any disrespectful comments. Lastly, a survey will pop up at the end of this meeting. Please take the time to answer it. Your feedback is important to us. On your screen now is the MassDOT Diversity and Civil Rights Statement. If you are interested in learning more about our diversity and civil rights policies and how they affect our public meetings, please contact the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. I will now hand things back over to our project manager, Chris. Thanks, Kayla. A flyer available in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Haitian Creole was posted to the MassDOT website on January 9th to advertise this meeting. The meeting was also advertised in the Charlestown Patriot Bridge, Somerville Medford Transcript Journal, and the Somerville Times. Other methods of public outreach included notifications sent to the neighborhood organizations and community groups, as well as a legislative briefing on February uh, 8th to inform elected officials of the meeting. I apologize, that was on February 9th. Uh, we'd like to thank MassDOT, the city of Somerville, and other important networks for spreading the word. A copy of the notice will be attached to the final meeting transcript. Now I'd like to welcome the team members who have joined for this evening's meeting. As stated earlier, I'm Christopher Cameron, project manager for MassDOT's Highway Division headquarters in Boston. Next, we also have Brian Fallon, the project development engineer from MassDOT District 4 office. We also have Dan Fielding from the MassDOT Legislative Affairs office. 
And our producers this evening are Leah Grodstein and Kayla Suso. Additionally, we have Brad Rawson, the Director of Mobility from the City of Somerville, who would like to say a few words about the project. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everybody. My name is Brad Rawson. I'm a Somerville resident, and I serve our great city as Director of Mobility in Mayor Ballantyne's office. I want to welcome our residents, our stakeholders, and our elected officials, and really just thank you for volunteering your time tonight uh, to work with us and with our partners at MassDOT on this important project. Folks, for the last 15 or 20 years, the Somerville community has spoken with one voice, which is that we want our streets to be safe no matter how you get around. We have rightly recognized McGrath Highway as a road that divides our community, increases safety risks, um, increases environmental justice impacts, the disparate impacts of safety, chronic exposure to traffic related pollution, and really just cuts our neighborhoods off from one another. I wanna thank our partners at MassDOT for advancing this critical project. Folks, this stuff is hard. We are talking about infrastructure that was established 50 or 60 years ago. And I want to take my hat off to MassDOT for having the courage and the competence to attempt um, such big transformative investments in urban communities like Somerville and know that the problems that we are experiencing are similar in many, many other parts of the Commonwealth. Uh, so really appreciate everybody being here tonight. We are at the beginnings of this process. We've got years of the journey ahead. But stick with us. We're going to do this. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Brad. I'd like to also introduce our design team. We have from Bowman, we have Gary McNaughton, Maureen Schlebeck, and Bill Van Duzer. And from GPI, who's teamed up on the design, we have John Tamburini and Sean McIntyre. And this makes up the design consultant team for our project, who have done a tremendous job for us so far and continue to do a great job getting this project moving forward. During this presentation, we'll explain the purpose of the project, our approach to the project, and communicate what the project is trying to accomplish. We'll also explain how you can submit your comments and questions about the project, which may be included in the transcript. We just started with the welcome and opening remarks, and we'll continue with the project overview, which will touch on the project area, history, and existing issues. We'll then move on to the purpose and proposed design. And then, then we'll move on to the impacts to pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, we'll move on to construction impacts. And lastly, we'll discuss the next steps moving forward, followed by our contact information. And then lastly, we'll open the meeting up to questions and feedback. Uh, we currently estimate the total project cost to be upward of $150 million. It is programmed in the statewide transportation improvement program starting in federal fiscal year 2027 for eventual construction. Total estimated cost does not include any right of way acquisition costs, which are not anticipated at this time. The design is expected to be completed in the summer of 2028 and we'll move on to construction shortly after. Now we can move on to the substance of the presentation. Please keep in mind that the project we are presenting is still in the preliminary design stage. All of your questions and comments will be taken into consideration as we move forward with the, de with the design. The project consists of Route 28 slash McGrath Highway from Third Street in Cambridge, extending northward across the Squires Bridge and the McCarthy overpass past Washington Street then continuing on to the terminus at Broadway in Somerville. The project area is abutted by the Brick Bottom neighborhood in the southeast, Union Square to the west, and East Somerville to the north and east. The McGrath corridor within the project limits really consists of three segments, separated by bridges over the rail lines. The southern section from 3rd Street to the Squires Bridge, the central segment between the two rail bridges, which is where the McCarthy overpass will be removed, and then the northerly section from the Truss Bridge to Broadway. 
As the project advances, uh, given the overall cost, the sections I just described may advance along different construction timelines based on funding availability. Now I'll hand over the presentation to our design team. Gary will first discuss why the project was initiated. Gary. Thanks, Chris. So the need to address long-term maintenance and repairs along McGrath Highway and the McCarthy Overpass in particular was identified in 2011 and was the focus of what became the Grounding McGrath study at that time. Through an extensive public outreach program, the study evaluated a number of alternatives and concluded the McCarthy Overpass should be removed and McGrath Highway restored to an at-grade boulevard-type roadway to reconnect the neighborhoods of Somerville. In 2015, the process continued into design development and further refinement, including establishing the number of lanes and intersection configurations. Input on the preferred alternative and the specific de design elements was gathered from the working group and the public to refine this alternative for the new McGrath Boulevard. That effort and the continued public outreach process led to the project being included in the Regional Transportation Plan for Construction Funding. In 2021, the pre-25% design process began with the collection of detailed survey information, environmental studies, utility research, and refinement of the design. The project remains on track for construction funding in fiscal year 2028. Outreach for this project really dates back to the Grounding McGrath study over 10 years ago. The most recent project development phase included a variety of meetings spearheaded by a well-represented working group and supported by outreach through multiple channels. This process affirmed the goal of removing the overpass and refined the designs that you'll see tonight. It was during this process that the construction funding was secured. The original impetus for the project was the need for long-term structural repairs to the McCarthy overpass. That need for extensive repairs offered the opportunity to evaluate the purpose of the overpass and how McGrath Highway fits within the context of Somerville. The overpass was built in an era when designs catered almost exclusively to the automobile, and it is overbuilt for today's traffic volumes. Furthermore, the overpass impedes travel options such as walking or biking and effectively bisects the neighborhoods. McGrath Highway does more than divide neighborhoods. It presents safety challenges and makes travel uncomfortable, particularly for non-vehicle users. It treats non-motorists as an afterthought. It is out of place in a dense, urban, walkable community. It, it contributes to poor health outcomes for nearby residents forced to inhale the fumes from vehicles. It contributes to climate change with an outmoded design that is not resilient to our changing climate. And the elevated highway reinforces inequities in transportation, which are antithetical to Somerville's identity. So what do we want to accomplish? The project goals were identified through the public engagement to reflect Somerville, such as reduce traffic violence, improve safety, outcomes for everyone who travels on or across McGrath and supporting the shared Vision Zero objectives to eliminate fatalities and severe injuries. Enhance transportation equity by improving connectivity across Somerville to rapid transit connections and the Somerville community path with high quality walking and cycling facilities to a disadvantaged community. Pr promote sustainable transportation options that reduce vehicle miles traveled and help the city meet its climate goals. Improve the comfort of people walking, cycling, and taking the bus. Reconnect East Somerville and Brick Bottom with the rest of the city. And improve resiliency from worsening storms and a changing climate. And upgrade the McGrath Corridor to be accessible by people of all abilities. A predecessor of this project is the recently completed Casey Arboy project in the far Forest Hills section of Boston. The Casey Arboy was built in a similar 1950s era overpass that was not serving its original intent, but was instead bisecting a neighborhood and preventing comfortable access for walking and biking. That overpass was removed and replaced with an at-grade boulevard with separate facilities for people walking and biking and connections to nearby parks and bicycle facilities, much like the vision for McGrath Boulevard. The overarching vision for the corridor is a landscape boulevard prioritizing safety and comfort for people walking, cycling, and taking transit. This vision will be achieved through dedicated accommodations for walking and biking integrated with enhanced landscaping. Reintroducing natural elements will create an enjoyable experience traveling in what is now a concrete jungle. 
Additionally, sustainability elements will be incorporated into the design to make stormwater effectively and mitigate the potential impacts of future sea level rise. As you see in this intersection schematic, key design elements that include separated bike lanes, shorter protected crossings to improve the safety and experience of people walking, opportunities for landscaping and green design elements, culminating in the transformation from a highway feel to a more appropriate urban boulevard for the city of Somerville. We are fortunate to have a project corridor with a wide state highway layout, a public area that is owned by the state. The wide layout provides space to design improvements and avoid impacts to surrounding properties, especially with removal of the McCarthy overpass. The design team is working to stay within the existing layout limits and expect only limited impacts to abutting properties. Design details have been developed to a point where property have not been developed to a point where property impacts can be determined. If we do encounter impacts outside of the state highway layout as the design is advanced, we will share this information with the, the public and the affected landowners. As mentioned previously, and as noted under step two of the previous slide, coordination with adjoining projects will be ongoing. The relevant projects include Rutherford Avenue reconstruction, Silver Line Extension Alternatives Analysis, the redevelopment of 200 McGrath Highway, the MBTA Bus Network Redesign, the Brick Bottom Neighborhood Redevelopment, the Broadway Bus Lane Project, the intersection improvements at Mystic Ave, McGrath Highway, Fellsway, and I-93, and the Poplar Street Pump Station Project, and the Squires Bridge Replacement Project on McGrath Highway over Somerville Ave Extension and the MBTA lines which abuts this project. We'll be coordinating the design and eventual construction with these projects to ensure consistent planning and limiting construction impacts. The Squires Bridge, as I just mentioned, located in the southern part of the project corridor, will be replaced in a separate project by MassDOT. Although this project is still in its early stages, it presents opportunities to improve the design of McGrath Boulevard over the bridge incorporating similar multimodal accommodations as the ma main McGrath Boulevard project. The two projects will collaborate closely with shared team members to ensure continuity and coordination as they progress. Clearly the Boulevard project is not the only thing happening in this area. The Green Line extension is now running alongside the completed community path extension. This past fall, MassDOT was able to resurface large sections of the McGrath Highway corridor from 3rd Street and Rupo Road in Cambridge to Broadway and Somerville. With this work, a travel lane was repurposed along McGrath Highway to provide additional space for buffered bike lanes and pedestrian features once construction is complete. This effort accelerates some of the benefits for people walking and cycling that are part of the McGrath Boulevard project. This condition is now set to be the base condition for the traffic analysis for the McGrath Boulevard project going forward. The resurfacing project will be completed once current bridge work on the Squires Bridge and Highland Avenue Railroad Trust Bridge have been completed. So what analysis has been completed? This corridor and many of the surrounding roadways and intersections have been the subject of intense traffic analysis and, mo and modeling over the past several years. Within the limits of work for McGrath Boulevard, you see the 10 study area intersections that are the subject of the design. Detailed pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicle data has been collected and projected for each of those locations to feed into the analysis that informs the design. One of the more notable facts about traffic data for this corridor is the consistent downward trend for vehicle volumes, particularly in the southbound direction heading into Boston. This has always been a corridor, corridor characterized by higher southbound volumes than northbound, but that gap has closed significantly and overall volumes have decreased by over 40% since the days of the grounding McGrath study. Those lower volumes support the concept of removing the overpass and offer flexibility in the design of the roadway to achieve all the project goals. We are seeing trends in traffic that continue to reveal McGrath Boulevard or McGrath Highway is overbuilt as we continue to study the corridor. In addition to the overall volumes decreasing over the course of the entire day, the peak hour volumes have decreased and are now not as pronounced as they were in 2011. You'll notice the sharp peaks from 2011 with southbound volumes of roughly 3,000 vehicles 
have flattened and peak hour volumes are generally under 2,000 vehicles. This reinforces the need to support the other travel modes people are choosing now as motor vehicle volumes continue to trend downward on this roadway. So what is the preferred alternative? The design alternative is largely similar to what was established in the previous design development process, but it is not the final design and we welcome continued input as the design advances. This alternative was developed through the detailed analysis and public process completed in the earlier stages. We considered a wide range of alternatives and intersection configurations, along with alternatives for including dedicated transit lanes along the corridor. Ultimately, the design you'll see tonight incorporates the comments and presents the alternative that best accomplishes the project goals. The project will have fewer travel lanes in existing conditions with separate facilities for people walking and biking and opportunities for landscaping along the corridor. There will be added opportunities for people to cross the roadway, helping to reconnect the neighborhoods. Transit will be enhanced with improved stop locations and passenger amenities and connections to the Green Line extension. We did evaluate dedicated transit lanes and determined they were not desirable due to impacts on pedestrian and bicycle accommodations, well as landscaping along the corridor. In general, one of three travel lanes is removed in each direction and that space is reallocated to sidewalks, separated bike lanes, and enhanced bus stops along with new opportunities for trees and landscape. What you'll see along McGrath Boulevard is a reimagined roadway that won't be dominated by automobile infrastructure. The overpass and median barriers to prevent corridor crossings and block sight lines will be replaced by medians with plants and trees. At this point, I'll turn it over to Bill Van Duzer to talk about how the preferred alternative design has been advancing. Bill? Thanks, Gary. As we've mentioned previously, the design team is focused on letting public feedback inform the concept design and achieve the overarching vision for a boulevard that prioritizes safety and comfort for everyone. Four key locations within the project have been selected here to highlight how this vision is being implemented. On this slide, we show the project corridor north of Squires Bridge, seen at the left of the screen, and ending at the Broadway intersection at the right of the screen. As shown circled on the image, the first location is at the intersection of McGrath Highway, Poplar Street, Medford Street and Somerville Avenue. This is the first of four locations we'll cover beginning in the south and then moving north, which is moving left to right on the slide. So let's zoom into location one now. Again, location one is the area where Medford Street, Somerville Avenue and Poplar Street intersect. On the rendering, Medford Street is shown in the upper left corner, Somerville Avenue shown intersecting from the upper right corner and Poplar Street is intersecting from the south. Poplar Street connects to the Brick Bottom neighborhood, also shown at the bottom of the rendering. At the top of the rendering is the shopping plaza anchored by Target. Currently, when traveling northbound over the Squires Bridge, the roadway drops into a signalized intersection with Poplar Street. Heading southbound, coming from the north, McGrath Highway is an overpass traversing the intersections with Somer Somerville Avenue and Medford Street. The rendering shows the proposed boulevard in the dark gray color. Separate, separated bike facilities are highlighted light blue. The sidewalks are shown in orange and potential green space is colored green. The pink areas highlight bus stops and bus lanes. The design proposes to enhance human scale connectivity and safety in the area by reconfiguring the intersection layout. This involves realigning Medford Street with Poplar Street to make the intersection less awkward and create a direct connection to the Brick Bottom neighborhood, which doesn't exist today. Somerville Avenue will connect to McGrath Boulevard just to the north as a T intersection. The rendering shows a bypass connection between Somerville Avenue directly to Medford Street west of McGrath. The proposed intersections, as well as the rest of McGrath Boulevard north of the Squires Bridge, will be at the grade of the surrounding street network. It is important to mention that this may not be the final configuration as adjacent development is still being planned and coordinated, particularly with the large development at 200 McGrath that's currently proposed between Medford Street, the MBTA tracks and Squires Bridge. There are also city projects on the Northeast corner of Poplar Street and redevelopment in the Brick Bottom neighborhood. Of note, 
is the proposed improvements along Somerville Avenue, otherwise known as Scary Way, which will bring people walking and cycling more comfortably to the south where they can cross underneath Squires Bridge. One last point, traffic signals will be provided at the major intersections along the entire length of the boulevard, uh, which will feature signalized crossings for people on foot and bike. This slide shows a rendered cross-section view of McGrath Boulevard just north of the proposed intersection with Somerville Avenue. At the center of the section, a yellow-orange dashed line highlights the outline of McCarthy Overpass being removed to make way for these improvements. As with the rest of the corridor, vehicle lanes will be repurposed for additional green space, bike lanes, sidewalks, and crosswalks, while the overall boulevard will have fewer vehicle lanes. Additional lanes are necessary at the intersections. In this cross-section rendering, you can see a sidewalk with people walking, a separated cycle track for cyclists proposed on both sides of McGrath Boulevard. The roadway section for location one includes two northbound lanes and three southbound travel lanes for vehicles with a raised landscape meeting divide, median dividing them. Green space will be introduced as landscaping opportunity areas to buffer the different travel modes, shade trees, and add tremendous value to people walking and biking and enhance the overall experience. As you will notice throughout the presentation, there will be ample opportunities to integrate natural landscapes into the boulevard design. On this slide, we have a picture of the existing condition looking north across Somerville Avenue and the intersection. Currently, there is limited space to walk and bike, as well as limited protection for vehicles. Comfort and safety are limited for people traveling by foot and bike. In the proposed conceptual design rendering from a similar vantage point, there is a clear separation between the two-way cycle track and sidewalk with landscape buffer. The cycle track is further separated from the roadway by another landscape buffer, which also includes a bus waiting area. This design aims to create a more inviting environment for people traveling along the boulevard, boulevard, providing them with enhanced safety and comfort. Next, we'll move about 1,000 feet to the north and highlight the intersection with Washington Street. This rendering uses the same colors to highlight accommodations for the different travel modes, walking, biking, bus transit, and motor vehicles. The proposed McGrath Boulevard runs left to right and Washington Street runs top to bottom. The bottom of the rendering would be the east side of McGrath Boulevard. To the east on Washington Street, there is a connection to the recently complete, completed community path. Currently, on both the north and southbound direct, both the north and southbound directions fly over Washington Street on the McCarthy overpass. This intersection is a vehicle is vehicle focused with McGrath Highway. McGrath Highway and Washington Street below. The at grade intersection along Washington Street below poses challenges for drivers due to pier locations supporting the overpass, resulting in excessive traffic signals and unconventional traffic patterns. Moreover, the experience of people walking or cycling through the intersection is uncomfortable with a high degree of traffic stress. However, by removing the overpass, we can simplify the interse intersection to one conventional signalized intersection and provide easier, safer access to Washington Street and the new McGrath Boulevard. The proposed at grade intersection would be designed around high quality infrastructure for people walking and biking to reconnect the neighborhood and remove the barrier presented by the existing interchange. While this segment of McGrath will have fewer vehicle lanes, additional lanes are necessary at intersections. The significant right of way used to accommodate the interchange with Washington Street today will be repurposed to provide significantly more sidewalk space and bike accommodations such as protected facilities. With the overpass structure removed, the consolidated intersection offers more opportunity for green space along the median and along the border of the former interchange intersection. During the concept development process, the team has remained focused on transforming the McGrath Highway into a boulevard, greatly improving safety and comfort for people walking and bicycling. As an example, the proposed intersection here would prohibit left turns from McGrath Boulevard in the northbound and southbound directions. The actual turn volumes were low for these moves, while shorter crossing distances and elimination of the threat from turning vehicles will have a greater benefit to people walking and biking across the intersection. 
So in this slide here, we see Washington Street, and as Washington Street finds its way uh, underneath the overpass and around the bridge piers, the area becomes a sea of unused pavement and is inappropriate and out of place, frankly, for a walkable community. The intersection lacks a designated space for bicyclists. There are long multi-stage pedestrian crossings and bus stops are wedged into vehicle-centric design, which all contributes to an unwelcoming environment, especially at the human scale. By removing the overpass, the space overbuilt for traffic can be reallocated with a more efficient design benefiting everyone. As the concept rendering showcases, a more condensed intersection allows for the creation of dedicated bicycle infrastructure, comfortable pedestrian crossings, and green space opportunity. The rendering envisions an intersection with dedicated two-way cycle tracks and sidewalks, which are creatively separated by a landscape buffer. The design features shorter and more direct signalized crossing for people walking and biking. A raised landscape median separates the northbound and southbound lanes. And just overall, the, the rendering offers a glimpse of the desired boulevard-like environment that the design aims to achieve by removing the McCarthy overpass. Okay, continuing northerly along McGrath Highway, the next section we want to highlight is the area around Prospect Hill Avenue and cross, the Cross Street intersection. The challenge at this location is providing a new safe route for people to cross McGrath Boulevard. While the desired crossing will improve access to the Somerville community path, the significant elevation difference between the intersecting streets makes a direct crosswalk impractical. Our design proposes a two-stage crossing with a median uh, within the median of McGrath Boulevard, which would be protected by barriers and a retaining wall between the northbound and southbound lanes of the boulevard. This design solution ensures the safety of people walking and cycling with convenient access to the path and potential bus stops in the context of the changing elevation. In the proposed design, the median walkway depicted on the previous slide will be safeguarded by barriers and a retaining wall on the northbound side of the boulevard located on the right. Also, an additional safety barrier will be installed atop the wall to offer people further protection from traffic below. This measure ensures the safety of people at this location. The proposed boulevard for this area includes two northbound lanes and two southbound lanes with a raised median between them. To ensure the safety of cyclists, two-way cycle tracks will be incorporated on each side, comfortably separated from the main roadway by raised landscape buffers. The landscape buffers will feature rows of rows and groupings of canopy trees, offering shade and creating diverse plant communities. This addition not only enhances the aesthetic appeal of the area, but also provides environmental benefits, such as improving air quality, reducing stormwater runoff, and providing plantings for pollinator habitats. Sidewalks will also be present on both sides of the roadway, with landscape buffers separating them from cycle tracks where space permits. The design takes a complete streets approach, providing safe and comfortable accommodation for people walking, cycling, and taking the bus. Our fourth and final location is located to the north of the project between Pearl Street and Broadway. In this section, the proposed design will reduce one of the three existing travel lanes northbound and southbound. The result will be a two-lane boulevard section in each direction. With the lanes reduced, there will be room for a buffered cycle track on the east side, shown on the lower side of McGrath in the rendering, as well as space for a wider median to provide additional opportunities for landscaping. Under the existing McGrath Highway configuration, there is a center median barrier with a chain link fence to prohibit crossing of the roadway. As part of the boulevard improvements, crosswalks will be provided at the signalized intersections to facilitate people crossing safely. The existing pedestrian bridge, which no longer meets accessibility standards, will be removed and replaced with an at-grade crosswalk near Otis Street. The crossing will include traffic control to enhance the safety of people crossing the boulevard. The ramps for the pedestrian bridge on both the east and west side of McGrath will be removed, which frees up space for additional uh, landscaping and opportunity. On the west side of McGrath, near the intersection with Otis Street and Dana Street, there is a city park that partially extends into the area of the ramp for the pedestrian bridge. 
The bridge and ramp demolition may temporarily impact access to the park. However, access to the park will be restored along with any impact of park amenities once the bridge is removed. The west side of McGrath Boulevard will continue to be bordered by the local roads of Dana Street and Edmond Street. We are expecting to retain the existing on-street parking as the project advances along with treatments to ensure these streets do not become used as cut-throughs to bypass the boulevard. The cross-section for location four shows Edmond Street to the left, separated by a green space and potential for plantings. This is similar to what's out there today. The new McGrath Boulevard will have two lanes northbound and two lanes southbound. Separating the directions of travel will be a center median, which again offers opportunities for landscaping. Then to the right is a two-way cycle track and a 10-foot wide sidewalk. The two-way cycle track will be buffered from traffic on McGrath Boulevard by a raised divider with yet more opportunity for green space. The cycle track will be delineated from the sidewalk by curbing to provide vertical separation. So how will bicyclists and pedestrians benefit? While walking is quite uncomfortable along the existing McGrath Highway, the redesigned boulevard will improve the overall pedestrian experience and will introduce at least two new crossing locations. Intersection designs will improve safety with shorter protected crossings where possible. Bicyclists, which currently have a high level of traffic step throughout the entire corridor, will see vast improvements with the introduction of separated facilities located at the sidewalk level. People traveling by bicycle will enjoy protected, protected crossings at signalized intersections and improved connections to the surrounding bike network, including the recently commu completed community path. You'll notice on this graphic that the existing all red level of traffic stress is transformed into a cor corridor with low levels of traffic stress, comfortable for everyone. So what are our next steps as we make this project a reality? Well, first, uh, we will continue outreach with stakeholders, environmental justice neighborhoods, and the city of Somerville, the city of Cambridge. Second, the project team will need to coordinate these boulevard improvements with other projects along the corridor. We have collected updated traffic counts and are in the process of updating the analysis based on the changes initiated by the resurfacing project. Additional safety studies through the corridor will be conducted to inform the ongoing design of improvements while the project team completes the 25% design plan submission. We will prepare environmental documents for public review under MEPA, that's the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Act, followed by the design public hearing before heading into final design. So there's a long way to go before we get to construction, which is anticipated to begin in 2028. We need to develop many details, including construction sequencing, temporary traffic control, and continued coordination with nearby projects. And as a wrap up to um, discussion of this alternative, we'd also like to just specifically reiterate that your input is welcome to further refine the design. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Chris uh, and he can go into how we can stay involved with the project. Thank you, Bill. Let me just get caught up here. Uh, as stated previously, the purpose of the public meeting is to share our idea of advancing the project and to understand what you think of what's been proposed. As the plans are not yet complete, we may not be able to answer, answer all of your questions or respond to all of your comments at this time, but we will do our, our best. If you'd like to submit questions or comments electronically, you may follow the links on your screen. Please remember to identify yourself by name and affiliation. Whether you're an abutter, local official, or concerned citizen, you may also choose to submit questions or comments in written format to the mailing address seen here. You may mail it to the department within 10 days of this date if you wish it to become part of the official record. And now Kayla will go over the Q&A process. Thanks, Chris. So before we begin the public Q&A, we have a tradition of letting any public or elected officials offer their comments or questions first. 
If you are an official, please raise your hand and put your name and title in the Q&A so that we can address you properly. Uh, to facilitate this, I will now hand things over to Dan from MassDOT Legislative Affairs to see if there are any elected officials in attendance at tonight's meeting. Dan? Thank you, Kayla, and please let me know if my audio is choppy. Um, I, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Dan Fielding with Mass DOT Government Affairs. Um, I know Brad Rawson talked off the top uh, for the mayor. We wanted to thank him for the city's uh, continued partnership with us on this. Uh, we met with the mayor last week as well as your whole state delegation. So just uh, to be rather calmly. If you'd like to raise your virtual hand, Kayla, I think he does. Yes, yep. I, and you are a little bit choppy, Dan, but I caught that. Um, so, Representative Conley, I do see your hand. You should be able to unmute your microphone and speak now. Uh, terrific. Can you hear me? We can. Awesome. Well, well thank you for the presentation. Uh, thank you for the briefing last night. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of the Somerville residents uh, and, and all of the residents who are here offering um, feedback in the Q&A uh, and in the questions to follow. You know, my my immediate reaction is just so grateful and positive. Uh, when I first moved to this community about 12 years ago, uh, one of the very first things um, that I noticed was how the McGrath Highway uh, was so out of place, how it set set up this barricade between the East Somerville neighborhood and other parts of Somerville and parts of Cambridge. Um, I can remember being at the Livable Streets presentation um, almost 12 years ago when we first started looking at this and to finally see these renderings and to see the concept um, coming together the way it is, it, it really is extraordinary. Uh, I want to say thank you for implementing that road diet as part of the current resurfacing project. I think that really sets the stage uh, for all of the progress that you're looking at here. Uh, we know Somerville is the most densely populated city uh, anywhere in, in Massachusetts and in New England. Um, we have a need for trees in the city of Somerville. And so to see all of the efforts that you've made uh, to create space uh, for more green space and for more trees uh, is really incredible. You know, this is really, you know, we could have a meeting to talk about each one of these intersections. And yet in this project, you are packing uh, at least four or five major intersection redesigns all in one. And so, again, I'm, I'm just so grateful and excited to see this entire vision uh, come to fruition. Uh, I do want to ask that you be mindful of the residents of the Brick Bottom community in particular. You know, they just endured the entire Green Line extension uh, construction prog project. There was also uh, a new development on the other side of their building that went through construction. So being very thoughtful about how you will maintain access for those residents during construction, and then thinking even more broadly to, to when after the project is complete, uh, really ensuring that we have smooth ways of people getting in and out of brick bottom as we look to turn that into an even more exciting uh, neighborhood in the future, I think is really important. Uh, personally, I think demolishing that pedestrian bridge makes a lot of sense. You know, um, I know for some residents that will probably raise an eyebrow. But of course, you know, our goal is to have roads and, and to really have streets that don't require uh, pedestrian bridges, but to have the actual at grade condition be safe and, and to have the, the street designed um, according to Vision Zero standards. But I would ask that you be thoughtful in terms of the sequencing and how you manage that so that during construction, uh, there aren't any vulnerabilities or dangers that are created. Um, I could probably go on and on. I'll, I'll yield the microphone here. I would just encourage you to um, certainly engage and review with all the questions that we're getting. I think there's a lot of great questions, but, you know, again, at the end of the day, <clears throat> this is just going to completely transform this entire part of the city, and it's going to reconnect 
the East Somerville neighborhood with East Cambridge and with other parts of Somerville. Uh, and so I'm just so excited uh, to see us push this forward. So thanks again. Thank, thank you, Representative. We appreciate your comments. Chris, uh, do we have any feedback on any part of that we want to share now? Or? No, I'm just very appreciative of the support and uh, the positive feedback and also the words of uh, caution, things we should be aware of. Definitely. Um, All right. Thank, thank you, Chris. Um, okay, I also see um, Peter Jalen, who I assume is Senator Pat Jalen, who has her hand raised. Yep, Senator Jalen, you should be able to unmute your microphone now. Um, I'm going to share uh, my thanks for this presentation, hoping it will be available uh, for everybody could, that may have missed it. I missed the first part. Um, but I had I was just curious why you think there's been such a dramatic decline in um, traffic and why it's higher in one direction than another. How do people get home if they went one way or the vice versa? And then I just want to ask also that people could, I've gotten complaints from people in Medford who feel that the commute from Medford to East Cambridge is very difficult now and that they are seeking uh, to go through neighborhood streets. And I don't know if you have any data on that or any information about, I know when we first discussed this, um, discussed the changes in McGrath Highway, people thought that uh, they, they didn't think there would be a, I think they thought it was several seconds of delay for people going southbound to East Cambridge. Uh, I don't know if you know what the current, how that how that has changed, if it has. I don't know if that's data that is available. Anyway, I'm overall extremely appreciative just asking some questions. Good. Thank you, Senator. And um, I'm sure I can work with the team to kind of follow up on, on what data we have and not and send that to your office. Um, We'll, we'll check back with that, but thank you for your comments. And why they why why people have stopped driving on McGrath Highway? I didn't know that, or fewer people are driving. That is something we're continuing to evaluate and try to determine. Um, and the traffic analysis is ongoing. It's not uh, we're still in the early design stage, but we're continuing to do traffic modeling and. Uh, analysis as we progress this. So it's definitely a, a work in progress here. Thank you for your questions and comments. Thank you, Senator. Um, so I do see we also have Councillor uh, Matthew McLaughlin uh, with his hand raised. If you want to unmute Councillor McLaughlin, Kayla, please. Yep, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hello, can people hear me? We can. Yes. Hi, everyone. This is Matt McLaughlin, World One City Councilor. I represent East Somerville and just over the highway of McGrath Highway. Um, usually like to speak last so that I can hear what people have to say, but I got a two-year-old who needs to go to bed. Uh, and I've also gotten a lot of comments already about this uh, from a lot of different positions. So I just want to preemptively just say a few things. Uh, one, I see a lot of comments from people who want to see more out of this project, and I hope, you know, we will continue to push for as much as possible to get out of this deal. Uh, but I do want to address concerns. Uh, I have heard concerns from people who are very concerned about this project period, and I just want to address that really quickly. First of all, yes, the footbridge, if it comes down at all, please do not take it down until this project is done, because it is still not a safe street to pass. And want to make sure that people can get by uh, when, especially when all this construction is happening. So, uh, absolutely, I think this footbridge. Ha I would, I would probably keep it just because it's still a safe alternative. But if it is coming down, please make that be last. Um, and then, you know, I have heard concerns from people about traffic, about construction. Um, I am a person who grew up. Uh, there's more years. Uh, on this planet, dealing with big dig construction than years not dealing with big dig construction. So I understand those concerns and the fear of uh, what might happen. This is going to be a hardship for us for a few years. Uh, there's no way around it. 
Uh, the project may take longer than anticipated. It may cost more. We're going to be dealing with a lot of construction issues. And I hope people here, I'll leave my contact information in the chat box. So if people want to contact me about their concerns and Rep Connolly and Senator Jalen, you can always contact us about it. In terms of some of the comments I've seen about, you know, just not doing this at all. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, Matt Damon's quote from The Departed, where he says that I'm Irish and I will live with something being wrong for the rest of my life. And I think sometimes uh, we get so accustomed to things being wrong that trying to right that wrong seems like a wrong in itself. And in this case, this is Mass DOT, I believe, making a good faith effort to right a historic wrong. Uh, this highway was never built for us. It wasn't built for Somerville residents. It has literally segregated the community, East Somerville, from the rest of the city. Uh, and it has caused death in the community and pollution, all sorts of issues that I feel like are finally being addressed. Uh, so I don't want to throw that away. And I, I do think that ultimately this will be an improvement on the entire community. And it's just something I'm, I'm Irish as well, but I can't live with things being wrong. And I definitely appreciate people looking at this long term and seeing the potential good this has. I can't live with someone like Marshall Mack, who was a 72 year old veteran who got hit by a car on McGrath Highway and was killed uh, and several other fatalities, and traffic issues and just the difficulty everyone in my community has just leaving East Somerville to get out of the community. You have to cross a highway no matter which way you go. So I am looking forward to this. Um, I, I definitely think that we should push for as much as possible. And just anybody who is concerned, I just want to address that's my position as someone who grew up in the city and has lived with a wall separating East Somerville for decades. Uh, but I always I don't want to diminish or dismiss anyone's concerns. So if people uh, still have concerns, please continue to reach out to all of us. And I'll leave my information in the chat box. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Counselor. And uh, I know we spoke at the uh, Mafia Way meeting. You have our, our contact info as well. So please keep us posted with any questions or concerns. Um, so that's all I see for elected officials. If I missed anyone, uh, my apologies. Please feel free to uh, participate in the general Q&A. Again, I want to thank all the officials as well as Brad Ross and the mayor for their continued uh, par participation and support. So with that, Kayla, I will hand it back to you. All right. Thank you, Dan. And we do have um, many questions in the Q&A and a lot of raised hands. Uh, so it seems like people have figured it out. But in any sense, I'm going to walk through how to best participate in this Q and A. Um, so to ask a question verbally, you can click the raise hand icon and I will give you access to unmute your microphone. Um, you'll need to unmute it yourself to be heard. If you prefer to type your question, you can click on the Q and A icon and write your question and Leah will read that out loud. We're gonna go back and forth between raise hands and questions. For both methods, please ask only one question at a time so that everyone gets a chance to participate we will follow a two minute rule due to the number of participants and questions that we already have. And so we ask that you please be respectful of others' time. Uh, please ask one question at a time when you're speaking, if possible, uh, it usually gets you a better, more clear answer. You can always raise your hand again or submit another question in the Q&A box to rejoin the queue. And then one final reminder before we get going that once you exit the Zoom webinar, a survey will automatically pop up Please take a minute to fill it out. It's very short and your feedback is important to us. All right, with that, um, Leah, if you'd like to get us going with some of the written Q and A's before we go over to the hands, I think that would be I wonderful. will do that. Thank you. And we, as Kayla mentioned, we got a ton of written Q and A already. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I've been looking through them and I've seen a lot of questions about buses and bus lanes. Uh, so I'm gonna hit those first because I think it will uh, you know, answer questions that a lot of people are wondering. So in general, the first question is uh, by Cole and a lot of uh, other questions are similar. Where are the bus lanes? Um, yeah, that, that was asked by a couple other people. Um, Karen would like clarification on why there are no dedicated bus lanes. This could be the north-south bus route Somerville badly needs. David said, I think it's a huge missed opportunity to include bus lanes in the design. 
it seems like they could be included if less space was dedicated to a median between motor vehicle lanes. And uh, some folks mentioned, you know, connections to between Union Square and Assembly Square. That was Tom. Um, connection to from Everett to Kendall Square. That was Matthew. So in general, a lot of questions about the lack of bus lanes. We'll start there. Thanks, Leah, and thank you all for your questions. Um, this is something that has been carefully evaluated and will continue to be carefully evaluated. As we go forward in the design, we're still in the early stages. Um, I think somebody from the design team sure. will probably yeah, speak yeah. to this better as they've been involved in the analysis and yeah, thanks, Chris. I can I can jump in on that. So we actually did, and part of what's taken us so long to get back from the earlier public participation process was really a long, you know, an extended effort to look at what can be done for transit accommodations in the corridor, and more importantly, what makes sense. You know, it's not just a matter of what you can fit, but what serves the demand for transit. Uh, during that time, the Silver Line Extension uh, Alternatives Analysis was ongoing and looking at potential for connections from Wellington all the way down the McGrath corridor. The MBTA was working on their bus network redesign as well. And quite honestly, neither of those efforts saw this entire corridor as a, having a heavy transit, you know, bus transit demand. There's the green line that's already in place alongside it that serves some of that transit demand. And really what we were seeing was, you know, some lower density routes that are proposed as part of the bus network redesign on the Northern segment of the corridor. And then Washington Street is really what's going to see some heavier bus service, and that's already being planned for. Uh, and you're seeing some of the bus infrastructure on that car that are going to be integrated into this design. But that's really where the bus you know, demand is. Um, it doesn't mean that that can't happen in the future as you know travel patterns change and volumes change. We're seeing streets all over the Boston area that are being repurposed for bus service. So there's nothing that says this is locked in stone, but we did take quite a bit of time to really say what makes sense for transit. And we just didn't see that compelling demand at that point in time. But again, you know, things that we're continuing to evaluate as we advance the design. Thanks, Gary. And actually, there was a question uh, from CJ that said, would MassDOT consider implementing bus only or transit only lanes? in the future if vehicular traffic continues to decline? And it sounds like from your answer that the answer to that question may be yes. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, you know, no road is static um, for its life, right? There's always opportunities. And bus lanes are one of those simpler things to implement in a lot of instances because they're in uh, many times can be done with paint and some minimal um, signage and other treatments. So, you know, they're a fairly simple, low cost uh, change to implement. So, you know, nothing would be out of the question down the line. All right. Um, a couple other bus related questions. Cole asked if there will be bus priority at intersections. So the, the current design doesn't have, you know, a bus priority queue jump lane or anything dedicated in that regard. Um, we will likely, as the design advances, as we're working with the MBTA on their um, transit signal priority so that those buses have the ability to communicate to the traffic signal uh, as they approach to try to facilitate getting that green time. Um, you know, the MBTA is doing a lot of work to advance the technology on that for their, their vehicles in particular, and we'll be working with them as we get to that stage of the design to make sure that we have uh, that necessary priority for them. Thank you. And uh, another bus question from Holly. The proposed rendering includes a pad for the bus waiting area, but no benches or shelter. Is the expectation that these would be included later or were they deliberately omitted? Yeah, the expectation is those would be included later. They're just, we're not at that level of detail. We're just showing the area where the stops would exist. Perfect, thank you. And the last one on buses that I can see from Ron, uh, he's just noting that you may need to make an exception to the left turn prohibitions so that existing bus routes can continue to operate unchanged. 
Agreed. And but if you're out at the Casey Arbor way, you'll notice there is such a, a setup for a bus uh, route to make that connection. All right. I'll keep an eye out for any more that I missed. But for now, it seems like this would be a good time to swap to raised hands. Sure. So the first hand we'll go to is Sarah Lynch. Um, so Sarah, you should be able to unmute your microphone. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to raise my hand if I did. Oh, no. Okay, no problem. Thanks for letting us know. All right. The next hand we have up is from Ryan um, Kirikoff. I'm so sorry if that is not the right way to say that. Ryan, you should be able to unmute your microphone. Thank you. You got it. Yeah, it's Ryan Kirikoff. Hi, uh, I live in East Somerville and I serve as the vice chair on the Somerville Community Preservation Committee. Um, I am, oh, first off, thank you all for this and thank you all for your great work. This is all uh, steps in the right direction. I'm curious about the newly created spaces that are made from some of the street realignments. They're basically new parcels for, for lack of a better word. I'm thinking about, I saw an island parcel created at the Somerville Ave and McGrath intersection that was originally number one in the presentation and some others as well. Question is, how do we ensure that these new spaces are active, comfortable, urban spaces? I'm thinking about filling those with program park space, but probably better developed real estate as, as housing and retail. And I totally appreciate that realigning the streets provides some, some breaks, some refuge for crossing pedestrians, but it also can create a really massive, potentially windswept space that is way more suburban than urban. I think we've had some bad precedents set by the MBTA lately in Somerville um, with really dead windswept newly created spaces like at East Somerville Station, Ball Square Station, Gilman Square Station. So how do we plan to make those active and comfortable? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, that's helpful context for us. Um, something we'll definitely consider as we move forward in the design. I think we're really focusing on adding trees here as much as we can, adding green space. Um, but we'll certainly need to look at ways to kind of sh provide a little bit more of a sheltered wind block type treatment and some of those larger open areas. Um, Brad, did you want to jump in? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Ryan, hi, this is Brad from the city. Great question. Um, really appreciate that. It's very helpful for us and for the project team to hear that kind of feedback. Um, it's incredible when you look at Somerville's four square mile land area, approximately one square mile of our precious land is taken up by road and rail right of way. So that means we only really have three square miles to do everything else that is essential to urban living, right? Housing, job opportunity, workforce development, retail and service, um, green space, re active recreation and culture space. So your point is well taken, Ryan. And one of the things that the city's planning team will work with the state on is to make sure that if there are specific parcels um, that could lend themselves to affordable housing or other real estate opportunities that we work with our community-based partners, um, our community development corporations, our land trusts, uh, and, and others to say, what is the best use for that publicly owned land? As Chris noted, it may be for moving people, moving buses, um, safe crossings, but in the, in, in, in the opportunity to actually do real estate development, that is something that we will work on in partnership with the state. So keep asking questions like that, folks. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you both. Uh, we will go to the next hand up now, which is David uh, Tatarakis. Hopefully I did as good with that one. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, yeah. So first, I just want to say what, what's being proposed here is clearly better than what we have now. So just to any any criticisms I have, <laughs> I just want to give it that context. Uh, and hopefully we can get this going as soon as possible. Uh, that said, uh, Brad made a comment just now about the fact that about uh, about a quarter of the surface area of Somerville is dedicated to roads and and rail right of way. So it's a little surprising to me that this proposed design uh, seems to be making every effort to use every single inch of space that's already taken up by this road right of way 
with road. I mean, grounding it is, of course, good, but that's not the only problem with the with McGrath Highway. Part of the problem is just the sheer width of the roadway. I think you the design underestimates the how imposing this wide of a roadway can be to pedestrians and cyclists, regardless of if it's elevated or at grade. I, this feels like a missed opportunity to decrease the physical footprint uh, of the of the roadway. And I'm wondering, is there any is there any plan to perhaps revisit that uh, and and shrink the actual width uh, of the roadway? Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, that's certainly something that we'll continue to look at. Um, Gary, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and and you know, I think it's worth noting, and it may not come through in some of those images that we had. The roadway is significantly narrower than what will be out there today. Uh, there's no place where it will not have fewer lanes than what you see today. Certainly, in the area of the overpass, where you have you know, lanes at, at, at on the elevated structure as well as lanes along the outside. That is going to be significantly narrower. Uh, but, you know, we are continually advancing the, the, the analysis and we've just recently collected updated traffic volumes. Some of that information that I presented earlier showing those decreases, that's affording us the opportunity as we get into more detailed analysis to really re revisit and potentially revise some of those um, configurations and the cross sections and intersections, you know, we hear loud and clear, you know, let's, let's not worry about traffic operations. That is not a goal of this project. It never has been, you know, we are reducing capacity. We are taking away vehicle capacity and we will continue to do that. As we advance that design, we'll look for further opportunities. You know, we just, we want to come in here with what we have today and, you know, hopefully we can make it even better. Um, but, you know, as, uh, the analysis is really what's going to inform that process as we get further into it. Great. Thank you both. Um, I think we'll do one more hand and then switch back over to some of the written questions. So the next person we will hear from is Jesse Klingen. Jesse, you should be able to unmute your microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the team. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Jesse Klingen. I'm the uh, Ward 4 City Councilor. I'm on the other side of McGrath from Councilor McLaughlin. Um, i excited about this entire project. I don't have met. Uh, I missed most of the presentation, but I have a good understanding of what we're talking about here. My main um, comment or concern is the footbridge. And I concur. I uh, agree with and echo Councilor McLaughlin. Uh, with regards to, um, if not keeping it at the very least, um, doing it last. I have, you know, uh, Winter Hills Community School, you probably heard is out of commission, and therefore um, a lot uh, the students have been relocated to the Edgerly Building, which is right on um, Otis Street, which is uh, directly, you know, uses, uh, directly uh, connects to the, the footbridge. So um, it, Anybody coming from sort of the Foss Park area um, would come up, uh, this you know either Walnut or whatnot, and then and then cut across. So so you know I I'm just here to advocate for those children and those families and um, those folks and trying to get from uh, Winter Hill to East Somerville. So I would I would just add to that uh, those concerns around keeping that um, footbridge as long as possible, if not you know re uh reconfigure in some way or rebuild or you know certainly shore up any um issues or problems there are with the structural integrity if there are any um all right thank you bye thank you jesse for that um you know removing the ped bridge is certainly not something we're taking lightly or it's not set in stone at this point i mean We'd like to get rid of it because the idea is we're not going to have a need for it. There's going to be a protected surface level crossing there, and we would not remove the bridge prior to that. Um, we were informed about the, the school closure issue that you mentioned, so thank you. But thank you for uh, letting us know about that again. Um, yeah, Brad or Gary, did you have any thoughts on that? Okay. Uh, I think you hit it. You know, the bridge will absolutely be removed after we've got the appropriate at grade configuration and accommodations for pedestrians. But 
you know, I think for almost anyone, a comfortable at grade crossing is preferable to having to go up and over a bridge. Um, you know, it's it's not comfortable today. It's not practical. And that's why the bridge is there. But we we're confident we can make it a much better, safer situation uh, and, and certainly more comfortable. Agreed. And the the current uh, ped ramps for the bridge are not up to ADA standards. So um, there would be no way to keep it without redoing those completely. And there's a lot of park land around that area, which are impacted by those ramps. So um, our, one of the goals would be to hopefully repurpose some of that space. So the space that's currently occupied by the ramps. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm also seeing a, a lot of concurrence in the Q&A um, about the importance of the pedestrian bridge right now. So thank you. I see those. Those are heard. Um, I am actually going to just go straight to the top, take our very first Q&A question. There's 69 open questions right now. So Thanks for your patience again. This one's from Cole. Why is it going to take four more years to finish the design? And then there was a similar one from Derek. Is there any way we can get this started before 2028? Uh, we are doing everything we, we can to move this along. There's a lot of moving parts on this project. Um, Gary, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, a lot of moving parts is an understatement. You know, there's there's a lot of elements to the design. There's a lot of coordination, as you can imagine, in an urban corridor like this. There's a lot of utilities and other um, underground infrastructure that we have to coordinate with. There's a, a the review process. There's an environmental review and permitting process. So there's a lot of steps that go into it. Um, you know, so unfortunately, it takes longer than we'd all like it to. But, you know, four years is really, you know, the time that we're going to need to get through that process. And it's not just, you know, getting the work in, but getting through all of those reviews and approvals and all of that coordination. So we we, we understand the, you know, desire to move it along uh, and we agree, but that is the process that we have to follow. Right, thank you. And I put up our schedule slide to illustrate some of that. The next question is from Ron, who asks, the Somerville Community Path currently has no direct access to McGrath Highway. Will this project add access between the future McGrath Boulevard and the path? There was also a question from Becca, if there are possibilities for increased access points and exits along the community path. That is one of our top priorities on this project. So yes, there will be opportunities. I don't know specifically where they are other than at Cross Street. We're hoping to make a connection there. Yeah, I really think right now what we're going to be doing is enhancing the connections between McGrath and the existing connections to the community path. I don't think there was any, uh, nothing that's been incorporated in the design thus far to make a new connection to the community path other than where they exist and really making sure that you can get from McGrath to those connections. But, um, you know, I think as we advance it now that the community path is up and running, we can certainly look and see if there's opportunities, but I don't, I don't know what will be feasible as part of it. Chris, yeah, I uh, I'd like to also just mention, thanks for that question, Ron. Um, there are a couple of other efforts that the city is coordinating with MBTA and MassDOT, and in one case with the city of Cambridge, where private real estate development that is occurring adjacent to the community path has been required through its local and state permits to provide public connections to the path where they do not yet exist. One of them is near Roof Oak Road, um, in the Twin City Plaza area. So that's really, really exciting when you think about those East Cambridge opportunities and connections right on the Somerville border. The second is in our Brick Bottom neighborhood at the intersection of Poplar Street, Joy Street, and Chestnut Street. Um, and actually um, an interim step in that process is under construction right now as a condition of private development permitting in the neighborhood. So your point is well taken. The city will continue working with MBTA, MassDOT, and many other stakeholders 
to create safe and accessible crossings and access points to the path. And I also do want to underscore the value of what the project team has shown tonight with the Prospect Hill Avenue and Cross Street connection point. When we were all at meetings like this 10 years ago, that was deemed infeasible. So I really want to appreciate the work that the project team has done to look at those grades and figure out a way to get an accessible path of travel across McGrath to link up with the uh, cross street corridor and the community path extension. That's going to improve path access for thousands of residents in our um, Union Square, Prospect Hill, and parts of Winter Hill neighborhoods. Thank you, Brad. Um, I did see a couple of comments about that crossing at Cross Street. There was concern about medium barrier on a boulevard project, and there was also concern about the grades um, and with comfort in walking in the median. This is a, a recent concept that we've come up with to be able to provide that connection where it was deemed infeasible. So we're continuing to work through that, try to come up with a safe and comfortable design um, and really provide that access where it's needed, especially with the community path at Cross Street. We wanted people to be able to, to access that to and from there. So, yeah, on the screen there in the center, you can see the orange is where the proposed uh, median walkway is. And that would be protected by barrier. That's the only reason for the barrier in the median is to protect, protect the pedestrians and provide that physical separation from motor vehicles. Um, it, it was basically required because of the grade differential. There's no way to make a, a single stage crossing there, just given the geometry of the roadway. Yeah, Chris, I think it's worth adding that, you know, that walkway will be 10 to 12 feet wide. So it's not mm -hmm. going to be a narrow, you know, confined space. It, it will be as wide as we can make it. And it's looking like it'll end up being 10 or 12 feet. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'll leave that graphic up there for a little bit while I ask the next question. Um, actually, this is a relevant one um, based on what Brad was just saying. A question from Lynn. Should new developments at Route 28 and Rufo Road be added to the list of relevant projects with which HASDOT is coordinating? Yes. All right. So thanks for pointing that one out for us, Lynn. Uh, the next question is a suggestion from David. I hope you can work with the state and the city of Cambridge to rename um, the, oh, like renaming the road so it's uh, boulevard instead of highway. Yeah, because uh, Cambridge is a different name. It's O'Brien Highway and then it's McGrath Highway. So we're both. Yeah, okay. I think the question was about like calling it O'Brien Boulevard instead. It's definitely something we can coordinate with uh, District 6 and District 4 and with the cities of Somerville and Cambridge. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a couple more questions from the Q&A before going to raised hands. Um, but I also just have a request. I'm going to go back to our our slide that shows how to contact us. I noticed that since we started the Q&A, there's been a lot of people typing like that they agree with something that someone else has asked or, you know, like, you know, for example, there's a comment that says plus one to the center running bus lanes. Um, we definitely appreciate those comments and I think they will be very helpful in email so that we can spend the live time that we have with all the panelists addressing questions about the design. Um, so please, if you can, um, I think it would be really helpful to, you know, write in and express, you know, your agreement with stuff that's already been said uh, via email, uh, mass.majorprojects at dot.state.ma.us. That's just my request so we can get through the 67 open questions I currently have. Thanks, Leah. 
Yep. Well, yeah, while we're here, also a few questions or comments about where people can see the slides after. Um, Chris, are we right that the slides would be on the project website? For the yeah, we'll make QR sure code? they're we'll make sure they're added to that website there. Great, thank you. Perfect. All right, and last question from Moritz before we go to raised hands. Uh, Moritz says the area is very wide, with bike lanes on both sides, several lines of trees, etc. There's still a lot of space. We don't want it to become a green scar. Have you considered a more compact design and an additional row of housing on one side? That would make narrower and more of a neighborhood style and housing is badly needed in the area and selling the land provides additional funding. I think I saw some other questions in a similar vein as well. Thank you for that. That's helpful perspective. Um, this sounds like a broad question to me. Yes, Chris, thank you. And thank you, Moritz, and everybody else who has mentioned that type of coordinated land use planning, um, affordable housing planning, and transportation planning and design. Uh, the project team is taking note of all of that, and the city has always advocated for looking for opportunities to stitch the neighborhood back together with additional neighborhood fabric, meaning building stock. When we look at pictures from the pre-highway era, we see a much greater and more fine-grained density of buildings of mixed uses up and down what is now the Route 28 corridor. So again, those points are well taken. And it'll be fun for all of us to look for those opportunities um, to, to address the regional housing emergency. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. All right, let's uh, swap to some raised hands now. A well-deserved break, Leah. So I see a hand from um, Lynn Weissman. Lynn, you should be able to unmute your microphone. Hi, uh, this is Lynn Weissman. I'm um, the co-president and co-founder of the Friends of the Community Path. I live in Somerville. I'm really excited to see this project moving forward and how much you've done with trees and pedestrian and, and bicycle as access. Um, so I just want to commend you for that. Um, I just wanted to kind of point to the Rufo Road intersection as being an incredibly important intersection that wasn't touched upon in this presentation. Um, it is hopefully going to be where uh, the community path extension uh, in the Twin City Plaza area can connect with the future Grand Junction path. I know that the developments there have been working together um, on a transportation plan that includes uh, a ramp from the community path extension down to Route 28. Um, there are some uh, amazing features in that. Um, I just wanna make sure that there's public input to that process. Um, you know, uh, because of course it concerns uh, everyone, pedestrians, cyclists, bus riders, drivers. Um, so I just wanted to kind of ask if, if you know, how much of that will be included in future presentations and that whole intersection could actually almost require its own meeting because it's a very complex area. And I'll, I'll can I mute myself? <laughs> I'll mute you. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Thanks, Lynn, for your input. That's uh, really valuable. And we will definitely be looking at that intersection further as we move along. Um, did the city or the design team want to jump in on this? Yeah, Kayla, I don't know if you want to switch down to the slide. I believe it's slide 65. We actually have that intersection. Um, it wasn't in the primary presentation, just trying to keep things um, on pace, but we are, you know, looking at that and coordinating with the adjacent developments. There's still ongoing work to do to make sure that we are perfectly aligned, but as you can see at that location, you know, the intent is to continue to have those bicycle connections and in, uh, introducing some floating bus stops so that we have improved uh, amenities for the transit passengers. I know there's some questions and comments about re removing that slip lane, that south, that right turn lane from southbound McGrath onto Rufo Road. What you really end up with on that 
is just the geometry with that tighter angle between the two roadways, the just the turning radius for vehicles, you're stuck with that lane. And really the island just, uh, you know, you need that outside curb line where it is just to accommodate those turning vehicles. So the island really is just taking up what would otherwise be dead space and making some of those connections and crossings shorter for pedestrians and bicyclists. So, you know, we do expect that that right turn lane would continue but we'll continue to keep it as tight as we can so that we're benefiting the other modes and keeping their crossings shorter and safer. Perfect, thanks Gary. And thanks for pointing us to this slide. Uh, a lot lot to get in in one presentation. So we will go to the next hand. Um, Stephen Natter, you have your hand up. Stephen, you should be able to unmute your microphone. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Yeah. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Stephen Nutter. Um, I was uh, an advocate with Liverpool Streets when this project uh, first began, so I'm really grateful to see this project being restarted again. Um, and just so excited that you're all back to this project, and I want to thank the staff at the state and the city who have kept with it for you know, over a decade now, as well as the elected officials. Um, I just want to see what we can do to refine the design from now, you know, that's now like eight years old. You know, a lot of things have changed, even, you know, you know, all the mobility conferences that we've all gone to, have, you know, have really pushed things a lot further than, than we have, you know, in this design. And I just want to echo everyone else's thinking about this as, um, as a new park with a road in it rather than, the, rather than the other way around. I think there's still too many travel lanes in this design. The volumes of McGrath are actually similar to, to Mass Ave and Back Bay. Um, and we wouldn't have this sort of design in, 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 that, in that location. Um, so I think there's uh, an opportunity for uh, a new linear park here. There's about 20 acres in this project scope uh, that you've outlined here. Um, and I think maybe only 10 of that, maybe half of that would be for a new road. So what's left over is like almost the same area as like Foss Park. So it's really significant opportunity for us to really just take up as much asphalt as possible. These areas where there's, you know, a turning lane and then two travel lanes just really as much as we can kind of squeeze things down, push things over to kind of one side of the right of way and leave the rest of it, uh, of it for a park, um, I think would be really great. They, they kind of, we kind of did the same thing um, with the Rose Kennedy Greenway, you know, when 93 went away, we started thinking about it as like these cross streaks in this park. And obviously, it's the scale's a little bit different, but the idea I think could could really remain and just as much as we can do to rebuild the grid itself and not just have it a through way to get from from one place to the other. So I just want to thank thank you all and make sure that we can continue to refine this design through a good, robust public process. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we're definitely continuing to look at ways to slim this down. Um, we used to provide green space as much as possible ways to really provide that multimodal complete street feel. Um, we're definitely not using vehicle traffic volumes as the governing factor here. So this has been a design that's been ongoing and it will continue to be ongoing. We're still at pre 25%. Um, there's gonna be more opportunity for public input and there's gonna be a public hearing probably later this year or early next year, as we get to that 25% design. Um, and there will be more opportunity for public input at that point as well. So we definitely appreciate that type of feedback, continuing to look at uh, ways we can make this a livable, a livable better, better area connecting the communities, so. Thanks, Chris. Uh Kayla, could I jump in here? I actually just saw a question about this area or a comment. I'd like to take care of it while we're on the slide. Yeah, sounds good. good so uh, from from Joel, um, he asked if the slip lane at Rufo Road is necessary, which Gary just answered. Um, but then he says further, if it has to be there, bike lanes should remain physically separated on the right until the intersection to maintain safety for those on bikes. Yeah, hopefully we're doing that, keeping them separated along the right side of the roadway and then bringing them across. Um, you know, and this is an area that is the 
uh, Squires Bridge design advances. You know, this is an area that uh, may, be, may get updated with different infrastructure. You know, part of the, the Squires Bridge was driving some of the design on this southern end of the corridor. All right. Thank you. Hope this graphic and that answer helped. All right. One more hand and then back to the written questions. Sound good, Leah? Great. See you nod. Um, so the next hand is from Matthew Carlino. Matthew, you should be able to unmute your microphone. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Um, I first want to say thank you. Um, this is a much needed project. Um, and I'm sure everybody here would agree that this is going to make Somerville a lot more livable. Um, I just want to echo, there's been a couple comments about shrinking the travel lanes. And in particular, there seems like two intersections, one that's at Medford Street and, or I guess Highland and McGrath. The other one that's Broadway and McGrath going towards East Somerville. What I'm noticing is it seems like there's still the same number of turning lanes at the intersections. And with the same number of turning lanes, that increases the amount of time that it takes people to walk across the street, which then makes the intersections worse and unsafe. So it's worse for drivers because they're waiting longer and it's unsafe for people because it takes them longer to cross the street. So reducing the number of, I guess, turning lanes, because now there's one less travel lane. So you're going still from two to in some spots four turning lanes on one side. What you can do is you can actually decrease your cycle times. And then if you use things like approach sensors and really kind of like time these, and the only way to really do that is to limit people turning as people are walking or have one side stopped, you can actually make the experience better and shorter for, I guess, both. So you can have more through traffic without longer lights and you could have a safer pedestrian situation. So, and particularly the one that's going on to Highland Ave, where you've got that kind of weird raised crossing further down, that's an outgrade crossing that can be significantly shortened to allow people to not have to do or have a choice on whether they want to go across, go up that platform and then hit that other grade. So that just that's one area that seems like it's a missed opportunity. And then the second one is over at Broadway, where that, that intersection really needs to get shortened. Um, can I have, can we have one more question? Uh, my wife's sitting next to me. I think we just don't want to lose track of your first question. Um, yeah. So if the design team would like to answer that one. Thank you for that question. Um, I know Gary's been heavily involved in the traffic analysis with his team at Bowman. So do you like to jump in on that? Yeah, yeah there's and, a slide um, we can go to. Um, Leah can get to it. Yeah, I don't know if we need to at, at this point because and, you know, it's a little bit higher level answer. I think the, the intersection up at Broadway is kind of the junction between the McGrath project and the ongoing improvements up in that area. So that is subject to change as we get further in involved in, in coordinating with that project. So, you know, that's certainly an area where we're reevaluating um, as that as that advances. The Medford Highland intersection, you know, it's, it's kind of a unique area within the corridor where, you know, those folks that are getting on to Medford don't have a lot of options. And that becomes one of the dominant moves within that intersection. So as we evaluate the updated analysis, it's certainly an area where we as a project team would love to find ways to further reduce that cross section and the amount of pavement that we need. So we'll be looking at every opportunity uh, with that updated information and newer techniques to see if there's a way to reduce those lanes. So all of those are things that we're continuing to work on. Great. Thanks, Great. Gary. Sorry, did someone else have something? Yeah. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, this is Christine Carlino. Um, I'm a Matt's wife. Um, I am a resident of Gilman Square. And um, I'm also on the board of the Gilman Square Neighborhood Council. And one of the things that I'm interested in, in and I think others have um, asked similar questions, um, and I apologize if I'm asking something you've already covered. I've been sort of wrestling a uh, overtired toddler. Uh, so I missed part of this, but um, my question is, 
do you have a roadmap for how you are engaging uh, local community groups and just the local community specifically around these intersections and crossings? There's tons of groups along the area that are uh, really in tune with what's going on locally and some of the local issues. And if you don't have a roadmap, I, I would definitely suggest planning out a roadmap for how you are going to engage uh, local community groups in the conversation around these these different areas. But if you already have that, could you just talk about that a little bit? Thank you, Christine. It's uh, a great question. Do we have that? <laughs> Chris, perhaps I can respond. Um, hey, Christine, this is Brad from the city. Thanks for the question. Part of the city's role in this partnership with MassDOT is to help identify exactly those types of culturally competent, timely, locally based engagement opportunities so that this project doesn't simply rely on traditional night meetings, which we all know serve some people's interests very, very well and other people's interests not at all. One of the things that I appreciate about the long journey on McGrath so far is that the Mass TOT project team has been really good about bringing content into our neighborhoods. So we've done tabling events, street pop-up outreach events uh, a number of times over the last few years with Mass TOT staff and consultants. And generally, those things are done in partnership and in coordination with local activist organizations, neighborhood associations, et cetera. As this project starts to really pick up momentum again in the year ahead, I think that that's a really great point for the project team to hear from you, and it's been important for me to hear from you, that we can continue to work with our neighborhood partners, whether it's Gilman Square Neighborhood Association, Union Square Main Streets, East Somerville Main Streets, in addition to our traditional partners like Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership, Friends of the Community Path, Somerville Alliance for Safe Streets, and then the city's uh, official advisory committees like our pedestrian and transit advisory committee. Um, so your point's well taken and I'll make sure to be following up with the team on that question. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Thank you both. Um, we'll do one more hand and then return to the written questions. Um, so this next one is Joel Paul. Um, Joel, you should be able to unmute your microphone. Hi, uh, yeah. I, uh, Joel, something very strange happened and you got cut off. Do you mind restarting? Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Yes, a question about the bike lanes. I, it's, I was looking at an earlier design for this and that's why I put the, the, the comment in the chat earlier about the uh, the bike lanes to the right of traffic at Rufo, but it's good to see that it's, it is maintained to the right of traffic in the new design. Um, but I, I see that there is still no physical separation there. And, and that's actually the case in, on a lot of the, uh, the length of these bike lanes. Um, I have an 11 year old and uh, we often get around the city uh, on bikes and uh, a bit of paint, it does not help him feel safe on his bike. So um, uh, curbs would be fantastic uh, to keep the, the the bikes at a different level uh, for physical separation from the cars. Um, uh, I mean, just like on uh, the, the, the bridge over the Mystic River, there's a bit of paint that protects the bike lane. And I've never seen anyone use that bike lane because the cars are going, you know, 40 plus miles an hour there because of how the road's designed. And, and this seems like a very similar scenario that uh, if the, the bike lane is at road height without physical separation, it's just not gonna feel safe to bike there. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. Uh, you're definitely right. And we're definitely trying everything we can to provide that separation wherever possible. So um, that design, as Gary mentioned, and the Rufo Road section was kind of being governed by the cross section on the Squires Bridge, but uh, the Squires Bridge is actually under a separate project to be replaced. So there's opportunities to change that cross section potentially and provide physical separation, hopefully. So that's something we're continuing to look at as we move both of those projects forward. Uh, we're very cognizant of the need for that separation. So thank you for that. All right. I think it's time for me to go back to some written questions. We've got 56 open ones right now. 
And I am seeing right now a bit of an intersection theme. So I'm going to start us with a question from Cole. Will all intersections be protected intersections? Excellent question, Jerry. Yeah, the, the, the intent of the design is to make all intersections protected. Um, you know, as we noted, we're early in the process, so there's still some refinements. So you may see some sketches that don't, you know, illustrate fully uh, protected crossings, but that is the intent as we advance the design. So, you know, the, this image shows a, a good example of some of the treatments that we're expecting to implement wherever practical and feasible. Gary, Thank do you, you mind pointing out on this slide uh, what we're referring to when we say protected intersections? It's a great question, Cole. I just wanted to make sure anybody who doesn't know that industry term um, can get that pointer on the screen so folks know what we're talking about. Yeah, and really what you're seeing here is just making sure that those pedestrians and bicyclists have safe waiting spaces, you know, before they have to cross. They, there are opportunities if you're coming in the opposite direction, you know, crossing in this example along Washington Street, the bicyclists, the pedestrians that are waiting to cross Washington Street, you know, coming into the screen kind of towards you as a viewer are out of the way. They have a protected area to stand. You know, there's separate um, crossings for each mode. Signal phasing is done so that those, you know, motor, those more vulnerable users aren't at risk and aren't in conflict with vehicles. Um, you know, they're not shown on this uh, graphic, but, you know, we would have additional push buttons in the medians if anybody were slower crossing, crossed at the end of a cycle so that they're not getting, you know, caught within that intersection. Um, you know, we may in, in many of the instances along this corridor have those pedestrian phases on recall, so you don't even need to worry about pushing the button or getting caught in the median um, as well. So, you know, really looking at making this about the, the people, you know, the vulnerable users, those pedestrians and bicyclists as the first thought and not the afterthought. Thank you, Gary. And I think that also addresses Corey's question. Considering the, the width of the road, will there be pedestrian islands for slower walking pedestrians? And will the medians across McGrath Highway have pedestrian signal buttons? Yeah. Uh, is that the case for other intersections like this one? Yes. Awesome. All right. Um, Joan asked if we're looking into adding any raised crosswalks. Yeah, I don't know, Chris, if you just want me to take that, no, nothing along McGrath Highway itself, but certainly on some of the side streets uh, where we intersect, you know, that there, there are opportunities and locations where we may be able to have some of those raised crossings to make things, you know, more comfortable for pedestrians. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Jennifer, how wide are the various crosswalks, such as at Washington Street? First impression from the drawings, super wide. Uh, did you consider tightening the distances? And you can you provide a comparison to crossings that we're already familiar with in some uh, We're definitely aware that some of the locations still are quite wide and we're continuing to do everything we can to look at this again see if there's ways to tighten things up. Um, Gary, did you want to provide any more input on that? Yeah, and I think, you know, we're narrowing them as much as we can. Um, you know, you do get caught in some areas and particularly Washington Street. Um, on Washington Street itself, we have some uh, with constraints and trying to put in medians so that we aren't able to necessarily break up every single one. You know, so there are some of those that you are, you know, crossing five and six lanes of traffic. Now, you know, why we have so many lanes on Washington Street, um, you know, one of those lanes is dedicated to buses. So that is somewhat driving the width. So you may, you know, be looking at 50 and 60 foot crossings uh, along that main roadway, um, along Washington Street, along McGrath itself, that will be broken up. So you may have two 30 to 35 foot crossings with a median uh, that would be wide enough for a pedestrian refuge and to wait uh, if, you know, the crossing didn't allow you time if you crossed late or were a slower crosser uh, that you weren't able to make it across in that one that one crossing. So these ones that you're seeing, you know, there are three lanes. We're going to be keeping those lanes 
as narrow as we can. Um, so, you know, potentially 10 foot turn lanes, 11 foot through lanes and the like, uh, trying to keep that as narrow as we can to shorten those crossings for pedestrians. Thank you. And um, all right. The next question is from Cole, but I'm not quite sure what it's referring to. He asked, why is throughput for vehicles prioritized over pedestrian comfort at intersections? Um, yeah, Cole, and Leah, there's a couple of other questions that I think are getting at the same sentiment. Um, okay. There was one about creating, actually also from Cole, a lot of double and triple check crosswalks. What are you okay. doing to mitigate the risks? And there were some other broad questions about um, the necessity of these turn lanes that are creating wider crosswalks. So I think you could kind of bundle all of that up in a, how sure. are we designing these for pedestrians? Thank you. Those are important considerations, important feedback. Um, Short answer, we're not prioritizing motor vehicles uh, or we're deprioritizing them, I guess, as, as much as possible. Um, not writing them out completely, but we're uh, trying to provide safe accommodations for everyone. So the traffic throughput is not the governing factor in this design. Gary, did you want to add to that? Yeah, and I think that's important to note. You know, we I know in our presentation we used the Casey overpass now Arbor Way as an analogy for this project. One distinct difference was that project was designed to accommodate the vehicle volumes that were there. You know, that was designed back in 2013, 14. And we were, you know, and I was one of the lead traffic engineers on that project. Our, you know, direction was we need to accommodate the vehicles that are there. You know, we need to make sure that we're keeping that roadway capacity. Um, we had to get creative with the design to make that work without the overpass. That is not the charge in this instance. The instance is make a roadway that fits the neighborhood and fits, you know, the surrounding land uses. And we are decreasing the vehicle capacity. We are, you know, certainly when we looked at the older volumes, uh, when we started this process, we were not accommodating just even the existing volumes, let alone projecting forward. So this is really a, a paradigm shift for MassDOT and how they're approaching a project and really building it, you know, centric on the neighborhood and the pedestrians and the bicyclists. We'll continue to do that and continue to look at the updated traffic volume information and see areas where we can. But you do still have a roadway that serves the surrounding neighborhoods if you're getting into Union Square and, and some of the other uh, locations, you know, Brick Bottom and the like. McGrath is an important connection for you to get to and from your neighborhood, an important connection for, you know, emergency services and transit vehicles and the like. So we do need to maintain that balance of keeping the ability for vehicles to go through here. Uh, and again, we'll continue and, and Brad will certainly keep us honest and continue to push us in that direction to make sure that we are not giving any more space than we absolutely need to uh, for vehicles. Sorry, Leah, I may jump in to bundle a few more questions that so I think I'm, we're... So, don't you worry, I've got some more of them. Okay, <laughs> so because Gary, I think you started to get there. So I just want to uh, bring these questions to the forefront. There are a few questions about um, whether or not we're planning on mode shift. Um, so Cole asked, why aren't you planning for future demand and mode shift goals? And Joshua asks, is the project aiming to accommodate current traffic volume or is there a plan to take the opportunity to shape traffic toward a desired outcome? So I, I think you spoke to that, but if you could just, um, or, or Brad chime in about how yeah, that's and, being and, managed. I mean, I'll start and Brad can certainly add to it um, and probably say some things better than I will. But, you know, when we were looking at this with some of the earlier traffic volumes, and again, the historic approach by MassDOT is, you know, hey, let's look at the volume that's on the roadway today. Let's project out 10 or 20 years and make sure we're accounting for all of that new traffic that wants to be here. You know, again, not what we were doing. We were saying, what's the existing volume that we have today? Let's reduce that by 20 or 30 percent to make a road, make it fit the roadway that we want, as opposed to designing the roadway the traffic wants. Um, and we're continuing to do that. So, you know, how those, you know, we did a lot of analysis of how those trips then occur. Mode shift is part of it. 
you know, part of it may be changes in routes, um, changes in times of travel, et cetera. So we are continuing to rely on those to make sure that we have, you know, the, the roadway that we want and not letting those vehicle volumes dictate it. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, another question uh, related to kind of intersections. Uh, CJ asked if new traffic and pedestrian signals were being proposed for this project and would they be ITS? Would they be ITS? So just intelligent transportation. So, I mean, they will be smart signals. Um, we will have them coordinated, um, you know, so we will have the latest technologies. Um, you know, I, I don't know if we'll be implementing adaptive traffic signal control. That's one of the things we just haven't gotten to that level of design yet. But, you know, we'll certainly be taking advantage of every of the, every element of the latest technology that's available to us. And as I alluded to earlier, including, you know, priority for the transit vehicles uh, wherever their, their routes may lie. All right. The next one is from Ethan, who's asking about um, this intersection specifically, McGrath at Washington, and was wondering how it compares in size to the current Broadway and McGrath intersection. So Broadway at McGrath is currently, you know, seven lanes, depending on where you are. There's some slip lanes that occur um, as well. So, you know, depending on where you are in this corridor, you know, I think in the images that you're seeing here, there's six lanes right at the intersection itself. Um, you know, if there's opportunities for us to further reduce it, but I think even one of the lanes that you see in this image, that far side um, as you're going along McGrath really needs to be there for a bus stop to exist in that area under the current design. So. You know, it's it's a little bit narrower than what you're seeing up at Broadway, but, you know, this is really the widest section or one of the widest sections on the corridor. And if we get away from the intersections, you know, the roadways are narrowing down. You don't really see it on this image along McGrath, but you can kind of see it on Washington Street off in the distance where those lanes narrow down. Uh, so we are doing what we can to make sure that we're, you know, reducing that width wherever possible. you. Uh, the next one is from Jennifer. Uh, how many designated pedestrian crossings are going to be added to the boulevard and what distance between crossings is the standard that the project is using? Yeah, thank you. I think we have a slide specifically showing this, although I don't think it calls out the distances or the spacing between the crossings, but if you can jump to that Let's uh, see slide that shows the arrows crossing the yeah. roadway. Yeah, there you go. So we're adding uh, surface level crossings at Cross Street and Otis Street. And then I think all the other ones are existing crossings, but we're improving them. Uh, there's no opportunity to remove the Squires Bridge. We We need that bridge over the railroad, so providing a crossing there. That's obviously a gap in the network that we see. And we're continuing to look at ways to fill that gap. But at this point, um, that's going to be a gap that's going to be there in the foreseeable future. Um, but we are doing everything we can to provide connections as much as possible. Um, what is the spacing on those, Gary? Do we have a rough idea of that? Yeah, I mean, aside from the gap at the Squires Bridge, which is a little bit wider, um, I think, you know, frame of reference, that cross street to Washington Street is about 600 feet. Yeah, so somewhere in that maybe three, 400 to 600 foot range, yeah. roughly on average. Great, thank you. Then the last one I see that's generally about intersections from FD. When you stated that the new Otis Street crossing is protected and will include traffic control, could you elaborate on what exactly that is? 
the PHB slash Hawklight proposed in the previous June 2022 concept design won't provide enough safety for crossing four lanes of traffic, which will also be quite fast moving since despite the road diet, they're still straightaways. As others have pointed out, this crossing will be used by many school children. Uh, the crossing uh, treatment hasn't been identified yet. We're continuing to work through that design, gathering input, and uh, we appreciate that feedback. That'll be helpful in us determining what that ultimately is going to be. All right. Thank you. Um, take a break from all of the typed intersection questions and uh, end this with a funny comment from Ron before going back to raised hands. He said, someone at MassDOT has a sense of humor labeling the road to brick bottom as scary way. I think that's probably a, a local thing, but thanks. <laughs> thanks, Ron. On to the raised hands. <laughs> thanks, Leah. Uh, first hand we'll go to is Robert Collins. Robert, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm just listening to what everybody's saying. And I'm just, um, I just want to, it's not really questions, just more ideas. Um, cause I'm thinking of McGrath highway, not as just, um, just this sole project, more of what I'm looking for in the general Boston area and some of all Everett Chelsea area. Um, the I'm just hoping that the way the project comes out is connecting, you know, we some of all is, you know, we share a massive border with Boston, but there's really not that many ways to get into Boston from especially on foot, like, you know, like the Holiday Inn behind the Holiday Inn in some of all, there's that's a complete industrial area where you can't even get into the city unless you're on 93 so if you're on foot you can't you know you i mean there's you know you can get through in harvard square and things like that but there's a huge part of the city you just can't even get into to boston which makes it i mean that doesn't do any good for businesses you don't have so i kind of you know we're kind of touching on the same things um but i'm just hoping that this project i know you guys are working on a project in uh starrow drive um trying to fix near Fenway I mean Starro Drive initially was supposed to be uh like the Esplanade it was supposed to be a complete uh just basically a park um and we put Starro Drive in and you know I'm just thinking of I heard someone else mention a linear park like there's a lot of things that there's a lot of potential in this area um Assembly Row is doing good you know there's all these you know I know they want to do near the casino they want to do um they want to do they they want to put a stadium in um there's just so much there's just parts of the city it's just just i, I don't know but um all right that's all uh thank you for that we share a lot of the same concerns uh, we're certainly looking at every possible way we can to provide connections where they don't exist, improve connections uh, wherever we can. So it's a huge goal of this project and many other projects that are going on in the area. I know it's a big priority for the city um, and some of the surrounding cities and towns. So, but it's helpful to hear that feedback from just from regular people so thank you for that thanks chris um we will now go back to david so david you should be able to unmute yourself well thank you uh real quick i have a quick question but before that i wanted to uh just briefly acknowledge uh, I, I hear a lot of uh a, a language from the from the presenters about not prioritizing car traffic um you know, the, this sort of paradigm shift away from 10 or 15 years ago in which, you know, the design was modeling a, a assumed increase in traffic, right? This sort of more unfortunate traditional way of designing these things. And I do want to acknowledge that I, I it is extremely encouraging to hear 
uh, state DOT traffic engineers very explicitly saying that 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 uh, those design paradigms are changing. And so just I while I do think more could be done in, in this particular project to go even further in that direction, I think a lot of the people who have commented have have expressed similar uh, feelings. I do want to acknowledge that that is an incredibly encouraging thing to hear uh, from from mass DOT. Now, I do have one quick question about it's uh, kind of a detail about Rufo Road. Uh, you said a couple of times, um, I don't know if you want to pull that up so I can describe what, what I'm uh, talking about, but you've said a couple of times that that slip lane is required because of the geometry of Rufo Road. And I assume you're talking about the fact that Rufo Road meets McGrath at an angle rather than at a 90 degree angle. But why could you not just re build that tiny stretch of Ruf Rufo Road so that it meets at a 90 degree angle, thus removing the need for that slip lane. That seems like I've seen that that proposed for other intersections uh, in Somerville, where you basically just change the angle of the road a little bit. Now you don't need the slip lane anymore. That feels like a fairly simple solution. And I'm wondering if that has been considered. Thanks. That's all I had. Thank you, David. Um... As far as the geometry of that intersection, I think it has to do with the bridge just to the north of there. Gary, did you? Yeah, it's, it, it is a little bit, but it, it's also because it continues around and continues to curve, you you do actually have to straighten it out through the adjacent parcels. If we waited until we get past that to avoid you know right-of-way takings, you end up not being able to accomplish much of the straightening. After all, and we can continue to look at it and see if there's an ability to tighten that up because uh, we are certainly reconstructing that approach that you see on that drawing. So, you know, good point. We can see if there's an ability to even, you know, tighten that up a little bit further and try to um, shorten that. But I don't think that we could get it all the way over to a 90 degree T uh, just because of the geometry. If you follow Rufo Road, how it continues to loop around. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Chris. Um, there are a few questions about the slip lane to Medford Street as well, just while we're on the concept of slip lanes. I don't know if we could look at that one um, while Leah lines up the next grouping of questions. Yeah, I'm not sure. There is no slip lane. At, are you, are we I always forget there's two uh, Medford Street locations. There, I'm not sure exactly which where is they're Is there something about. I can go to to help us out here? Yeah, I assume that's the southern the southerly one, if you just go up, um, I'm trying to see which slide Four. it is. <laughs> yeah, maybe if you go it's to one, one. There it is. I think yep. it's one. You assume that's the one. It's, they called it, yeah, sub lane bypass lanes. We had a, yep. uh, many questions about this one. Yeah, it's one of those <laughs> unique corridors where Medford Street crosses twice. So, follow okay. yep. confusion. Um, so, this is an area, and you see the highlighted uh, area for the 200 McGrath project that design is you know not only subject to change i would say likely to change as we more you know closely collaborate with what is proposed for those parcels uh, some of that slip lane geometry was kind of a carryover from the legacy properties that were there and that we were charged with kind of avoiding any impacts to at the time and and in fact maintaining access so this is an area that you will see some revisions the next time that we uh, come around. Thank you. Want me to grab some more Q&A questions now? Yes, yeah, we actually don't have any hands, so that'd be great. All right, all right. I'll, I'll start firing away. Um, one of the things that I think we haven't hit on as much in the Q&A is like accommodations, and there's a couple questions about them, them, so I'll get started on those. From Cole, at location four, which I'll go to in a sec, why do people trying to go southeast from Winter Hill have to cross McGrath twice to go straight on a bicycle? Let's give us a visual here, location four. Yeah, and I don't know if um, you know Bill Van Duzer wants to talk about you're getting into some of the technical areas of the cross section and the width here. It's that's where the formal bike lane uh, and bike accommodations are, where they're on the opposite side of the roadway. 
there are, you know, Dana Street and Edmond Street that, you know, are very low volume, low speed roadways that are available to bicyclists, but because of the uses, we can't, you know, formally design them as bicycle routes, um, although they are certainly there and available for folks to use as a bicyclist, the formal infrastructure that we're proposing is on the opposite side of the roadway. You know, Bill, if I misstated or didn't cover everything. Um, yeah, I think, uh, is it Leah or Kayla, if you jump to slide 68, it shows the uh, the trust bridge area, the Highland Ave trust bridge area. Right. There we go. So if you were Dana and Edmonds, kind of a, a butt McGrath, we, you know, like Gary mentioned, the, the, it's constrained there. So those would be like a local street. And, uh, you know, we're working on the design, refining that part of it for there. But, you know, the intent there was you could you could ride a bike along those streets. And what we've done as you moved further to the south, so if you're talking about like you're on the Winter Hill side and you want to go to the south towards Medford Street, there would be a separate bicycle lane provided on the what do we call the west side, if you will. So the cycle track will be on the east side, and we would have a signalized cross and get over to that. And then on the on the west side, there would be a, a one-way bike lane to get across the bridge and make that connection to Medford. The okay. next slide shows a, I believe the next slide might show a typical section across the bridge. If, there you if go. This is what the the, the I believe there's some emergency repair work going on in the bridge right now as part of the, along with the restriping project. So the final condition would be very similar to what you see here from that project. Obviously, you know, we'll be working that in with our design. So it may change and progress from what, what's going to be out there. All right. Thank you. Um, just want to note that it is 8.38 and we have 34 questions left. and uh far less attendees 55 attendees for it so thank you for the people who are sticking with us the next question is from joel can a two-way cycle track be added to dana street by removing parking from one side this project should maintain two-way paths on both sides along the full length um i don't know where that one might be oh Yeah, you found it. Um, I believe <laughs> Dana Street is a city street, so I think that would have to be up to the city whether we could remove that parking or not. Yeah, Chris, th th thanks. Why don't I grab that one? I appreciate that question. Um, so for local streets that are low volume, like Dana, the city's official bicycle network plan uses a different strategy to make sure that these streets are safe and comfortable for people of all ages and all abilities. So again, imagine that uh, that eight-year-old who's learning to ride a bike um, on low volume streets that are not high volume cut-throughs. We actually pursue traffic calming and want mixed traffic in the street rather than dedicated facilities. So folks who wanna learn more about that, please just look up Somerville Bicycle Network Plan Dana is not called for specifically in that plan if memory serves, um, but we use a term called neighborways to describe that design treatment that, that I'm describing. Um, so again, I'll be happy to follow up with any questions that folks have about local streets for traffic calming, pedestrian safety, bike mobility, outside the context of the McGrath project. But please know that we do coordinate these things with our state agency partners. Awesome, thanks, Brad. Um, so we've heard a lot of support for the reduction of lanes on McGrath. So I wanted to read um, two comments that are actually about congestion. Um, so Julie wrote, I live on Mansfield. You can see my house in a lot of pictures. I use a car as is everyone I know. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. No interest in bikes, nor does anyone I know. Never taken a bus. Everyone on the call seems to be the opposite, which is fine. But as Somerville continues to remove car lanes and add bike lanes and sidewalks, what is the plan to alleviate the increased traffic that has been caused with changes to 28 Washington Street, et cetera? Now it takes 20 minutes to drive 200 feet at Sullivan Square in rush hour. And these changes seem like they will worsen that. And then we had another comment from Melinda um, saying that since the reduction of the lanes from three to two, there's been an increase in traffic along McGrath. Uh, rush hour extends far back. 
to adding to air quality problems, have we collected data recently about the length of time it takes to get from Broadway to Cambridge? So if anyone from the project team could speak to congestion, that would be great. Thank you for that. Um, first off, we did do traffic analysis shortly after the new striping plan was implemented. So we do have some data on that. Um, somebody from the design team, did you want to touch on that just a little bit? Yeah, so we, we as you noted, we have collected updated traffic volume information. Uh, since the lane reduction has gone into place, we have not updated the traffic, uh, the travel time information. That's something we can continue to collect as things settle in uh, to their patterns and we start to see how things are playing out. And we did do quite a bit of modeling, even with the earlier traffic volumes and looking at overall travel times. And, you know, certainly when you start to reduce roadway capacity, there is going to be some additional congestion at some of these locations. But travel time increases, you know, to travel the length of the corridor were, you know, in the, the seconds and a minute, minute and a half, they were fairly low numbers that weren't dramatically changing the experience. And as we said, there's a lot of other goals and benefits from this project that outweighed those minimal increases in travel times that would result. Chris, Gary, may I just chime in? Julie, Linda, yeah. thanks for raising those questions. I do want to uh, mention that on the main line of McGrath, we're still in the middle of construction, and that is definitely exacerbated queuing approaching those bridges like the Highland Medford Trust Bridge uh, or the Squires itself. Um, so please do think of the, what you experienced in the fall of 2023 as construction impacts rather than something that indicates the long-term future. But I will also note um, that we're in a tough moment right now where a lot of people have been coming back. If you're so lucky as to have a work from home privilege, um, folks are going back into office jobs and, you know, Interstate 93 has permanent traffic counters. Things are approaching, but not quite yet at pre-pandemic baselines for driving trips. There's two other factors that we simply have to talk about here. One is that the MBTA has been in a tough chapter of its history. Um, workforce shortages are causing fewer bus trips to be scheduled. And obviously, we've got these deep-seated historical questions about rail systems, safety, electrical capacity. And the MBTA, I believe, has turned a corner on some of those issues, but it is unquestionably a hard moment right now. Transit ridership is at like 60 or 70% of pre-pandemic baseline. And so everything that we do together as a community, as a region, has to really be geared towards making transit safe and reliable and get those folks back on buses, back on trains, give them confidence that they can get where they need to go. Because otherwise, who can blame somebody for you know paying a taxi or an Uber or a Lyft if they're late for a childcare pickup? So your points are well taken, uh, but please know that the city and the state are monitoring these issues. And we expect that um, traffic arm again, it is not the future, even in these progressive people-centered roadway designs. Well said, Brad, thank you. going to put us back to our contact slide real quick because I know it's getting late. So we didn't get to your question and you've got to go. No worries. You can also contact us by email at mass.majorprojects at dot.state.ma.us. Um, but for now, I'll keep reading some more questions about bikes from Joel. What are the differences between bike level of traffic stress one and two? Uh, Bill, I think you were the one that put those slides together. Right? Did you want to, or Gary, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I was actually going to call on Maureen and let her. Uh, yeah. Then she did a lot of the, the bike analysis work on this project. So. Thank you, Maureen Schlebeck from Bowman. Um, so I have to apologize because I was typing answers to the questions in the chat. So if you could just tell me it, uh, I, again. Yeah, it was questions. just the, the level of service, uh, level of traffic stress, one versus two. One versus For two. bikes, yeah. And there's okay. a similar question while you're talking, Maureen, about um, why are we aiming for a mix of A and B 
pedestrian service and what are barriers today for everywhere. So maybe just some okay. explanation on all of that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so obviously we do want level service A throughout for uh, pedestrians. Um, that is what we're shooting for. We do have a mix shown of level service A and B. And as the design moves forward, any improvement we can make on the PEDs, uh, we will do so. It, it's difficult to, to get a corridor with crossings fully to level service A, but we are working towards level service A on the pedestrians. Um, and let me explain traffic level service for the bikes. The traffic stress level one is really... Uh, anybody would feel comfortable biking there. So that's when you have allocated space on your street that is protected. Um, you'd be comfortable riding there with a child, for example. Uh, traffic stress level two is pretty comfortable for an adult, but probably not for a child. I think that's probably the easiest way to explain it. So as, as much as we can throughout the corridor, we are looking to have protected bike paths. So hopefully that helps understand the traffic stress level for bikes. Yeah, and I think the level two is just indicates that there's a intersection that you have to cross. Is that correct? Is it looks like it's only at the actual intersections? Yeah, so so the vertical separation has to break at those crossings. Right. So that's the only reason for that additional stress. It's not there's still that uh, separation on either side. It's just the crossing, the intersection itself, that would be um, an added stress, but it would be under a protected signal, so. Great, thank you both. Um, you know, what? something that goes into these uh, level of stress calculations like the speeds, and we have a lot of questions about the design speed of the road and which traffic calming measures um, are being implemented in the project, as well as some concerns that um, if trees are listed as potential, those could visually narrow the roads and reduce speeds. Um, and the question also specifically asked, is the landscaping left up to Somerville, thus out of scope for MassDOT? And is that why trees are listed as potential? So I'm sorry, I tucked two questions in there. Traffic calming and design speed, and then also, are the trees a potential? Um, and is that in the scope of the project? Uh, the trees are within the scope of the project. That is a huge element of the project. It's listed as potential because the exact locations and the landscape design have not been completed yet. That's the reason for the potential uh, language that we've been using. But no, that's a definite large element of the project is to provide green space, trees, and that visual calming element, as well as... Uh, any other traffic calming elements that we may be proposing. Um, Gary, did you want to talk about the traffic calming at all or your team? Yeah, and really the, the whole project is geared towards traffic calming, narrower lanes, you know, landscaping elements, really changing the character of the roadway. There are st stretches that are straight, but we're doing our best to break those up, um, you know, keeping in curves, we'll have intersections, we'll have new at-grade crossings, you know, a number of elements to really try to change the character of the roadway. And again, those those landscaping elements, the trees to try to visually narrow it as well, uh, so that it is, you know, a slower roadway, trying to bring those speeds down as much as we can. And I know the city is working to lower speeds on a number of their roadways. And they, you know, this will certainly be one of those roadways that we're focusing on trying to keep the the travel speeds as minimal as we can so that it's a safer street. Thanks, Gary. And then the specific question was asked about what the the design speed um, and speed limit are for the boulevard. Yeah, so the speed limit gets set, you know, later in as we're getting towards construction and even into, into implementation. Um, you know, fortunately, there's a lot of revised uh, methodology and ability to set speed limits and not be tied to some of the older ways that um, we were always struck by how fast are people driving that determines your speed limit um, and we can do some other more progressive measures to try to keep a lower speed so we haven't got to the point of setting it uh, but we know we do want to try to keep it as low as possible uh, yeah i think that's that kind of touches on almost everything we had about speed. Um, the one other thing that 
kind of tangentially relates to this and I've seen a couple questions on are just asking about the lane width and the cross section widths. Yep, so lane widths, I mean, they're generally gonna be 10 and 11 foot lanes uh, as we go through. You know, there's still standards that we have to meet, um, you know, because of the nature of the roadway. So we're looking to keep them as narrow as we can, um, but there are some standards that we have to meet. As we talked about, you know, the number of lanes, we're still evaluating them. You know, we've, and this cross section illustrates through most of it, we have two lanes in each direction, um, you know, and, and we've repurposed most of the other space uh, to the outsides of the corridor for other modes for landscaping, et cetera. So we are trying to narrow it um, as much as we possibly can. I know there was at least one comment about, you know, can we shift that space from the median to the outside? Uh, and I want to make sure that, you know, understood that the median really isn't overly wide. We've kept it wide enough uh, where possible so that we can add trees to it. But that is, you know, a 10 foot wide median. It's not a 20 or 30 foot, you know, Commonwealth Ave type median that you're seeing that would be wasted space, you know, trapped within a roadway. We're trying to keep it wide enough that it, the, those trees can thrive within it and have that real boulevard feel and help, you know, visually narrow the roadway and, and introduce some of those traffic calming elements, um, but not create space that's within the middle of two roadways where really nobody's going to want to hang out and enjoy that space. So we are putting as much as we can to the outside. Thank you, Gary. And actually, while I'm on this uh, slide, someone asked about some of the cross sections having four sidewalks and said, can we do just one sidewalk on each side? Is this um, a helpful slide to be on to answer that question? Yeah, this one's unique because you have cross street off to the right um, at kind of that lower level crosswalk or sidewalk that you see. And then, so it looks like there's a little bit more just with the, and then there's the frontage road. Um, so you do have some unique things going on here. We're generally not trying to do uh, four sidewalks anywhere along the car. This one just gives a little bit of a different look to it. Um, plus you have the median sidewalk. So there's a lot more tan uh, sections with crosswalk with sidewalks on that section than you would see in most. This is far more typical where we'll have sidewalks to the far outside, as far away from, you know, the tailpipes as we can get them uh, with cycle tracks and, and such uh, closer to the street. Thank you. Um, let me get us back here again, in case we'll need that email address. The next question from Tom is uh, can you elaborate on how the bike lanes in this project are being coordinated with those built in the 2838 project? If I recall correctly, 2838 includes one-way bike lanes on both sides between Broadway and 38, then a two-way bike lane on the west side north of 38. Could the directionality of these bike lanes match so that people biking continuously on 28 don't have to cross over multiple times? Uh, specifically, I think I saw this project showed south of Broadway, there would be a two-way bike lane only on the east side. Yeah, so we are coordinating uh, with that project as we move forward. The design did change significantly on that project, if I recall correctly, within the last year or so. So we'll be updating our plans as much as possible to try to uh, coordinate those bike lane directions and crossings. Gary, did you want to add anything? Yeah, and, and I, I'll you know let Bill jump in if, if he wants to add on it to that as well. There are some limitations. I think we talked about it earlier with those um, Dana Street and Edmond Street and some of the limitations of, of width for a formal bike facility on that um, northerly, I guess southbound, westbound side of McGrath through that stretch. So you know, we do have some limitations and that's why we've got the two-way facility on the northbound um, side of the roadway. At the right side that you see here, where you have the formal two-way uh, cycle track, as opposed to having anything on that, that southbound side or the left side of the roadway. That doesn't mean a, a cyclist can't use those facilities. We just aren't designating them as formal 
you know, official bicycle facilities. And I think Bill explained kind of that connection once you get past Pearl Street, how we would have something designated in that area. Thank you. I'll I'll leave this one up a bit since it's pretty detailed. Um, actually, I see Tom has his hand up. <laughs> I was gonna say the same thing. Uh, Tom, you should be able to unmute your microphone. Hey, uh, thanks. Really, really excited for this project. Uh, such a huge improvement over the status quo, and also generally an improvement over the uh, resurfacing road diet. So, really excited overall. I uh, just really wanted to make sure you're thinking about the overall experience. Uh, of somebody trying to bike on 28 continuously from, say, Medford to to Cambridge or downtown Boston continuously on 28 and minimizing their experience of needing to change sides. Um, so to totally understand that some uh, streets like Dana Street that somewhat serve um, uh, as uh, kind of adjacent streets uh, may not get formal designation uh, that's totally fine, but I want to make sure you're thinking about the, the overall experience uh, as these different mass dot projects connect. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to hear kind of overall vision of somebody biking, say, from the Mystic River to the Charles River continuously along 28. Uh, can they safely bike on one side of McGrath the whole way and avoid unnecessarily crossing over uh, if somewhere like Dana Street is kind of the designated route that's preferable to them? Uh, Somerville has explicit standards for neighbor ways around it is safe to share the street if the volumes and speeds are extremely low, building off of NACTO standards. Um, so that those may be reasonable, but uh, I want to make sure that you're explicitly thinking about like if that is a designated for people biking, uh, does it actually meet the volume and the speed standards? Is there actually like a safe and convenient connection for somebody biking? To, to transition from that uh, shared condition at lower volumes and lower speeds, uh, transitioning into the, the designated separated cycle track. Uh, so want to make sure you're thinking about that, want to make sure you're measuring that in your uh, LTS assumptions, and that we have a, an overall cohesive corridor uh, for the whole length. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right, I will once again get us back to our uh, contact slide and just keep on going with the Q&A. So from Jennifer, on the north side section, uh, are there bus stops planned for that section? Um, she said like by Otis Street. Sure, if you want me to grab that. Um, I don't believe there are any bus stops along McGrath today. I believe they're all on the side streets, but we certainly have the ability to incorporate them and we'll be you know, coordinating with the MBTA. I believe there's another question about um, one of the bus routes that currently uses the Washington Street area to turn around to access Cross Street. That's a connection that similarly won't be um, feasible under this design. So we'll be coordinating with the MBTA on what's the best way to accommodate those riders and make sure that we are continuing to serve them. Um, and if that results in changes or things that that initiate stops uh, where they don't exist today, you know, we'll do everything we can to, to include those within the design. Thanks. Yeah. Um, we actually, it is at nine o'clock. This meeting was supposed to end at eight. So I am going to close the Q&A to new questions. Um, again, we have this contact email. If you've got more questions to ask us or more feedback, uh, we welcome it. And I'm gonna see if we can get through the rest of these questions in as timely a manner as possible. So next is Ethan. It strikes me that this redesign will make the area along the graph attractive to build restaurants and other pedestrian oriented shops. Uh, I wonder if this design allows for outdoor dining in some of the green space areas or if the design would prevent that. I don't think there's anything in the design that would prevent that something 
we can coordinate with the city on as we move forward. Thank you, Chris. The next question is from Michael. How do you envision northbound cars getting into Union Square from McGrath? Sure. Yep, sure. And while we don't allow the left turn at Washington Street, uh, they can still make the left turn further south than Somerville Ave as they can um, today. So we have they'd still have that route. So it'd just be up Somerville Ave and then accessing Union Square that way. Thanks, Gary. Um, the next one is a comment from Dorian that I'll read. Thank you, Mike Connolly, for mentioning Brick Bottom. As a resident of Scary Way, aka Somerville Ave, and work in Brick Bottom, it would be great to learn more about impact to accessing Brick Bottom, not only for myself, but also for employees coming in by public transit and car to the neighborhood. Thank you for that comment. Um, I'll move on to the next question. Cole, what's the plan for redirecting 90 buses, which currently use the U-turn slash underpass as a way to access Cross Street? And that was the route I was referring to earlier. I didn't have the number at the tip of my tongue, um, but that was the route that we'll have to coordinate because that U-turn movement will not be accommodated. So we'll have to look at how that can be, can be adjusted. All right, thank you. Next up from Corey. Are there any plans to increase crossing over or under the train corridor heading to Medford slash Tufts? This also appears to be something that prevents bicycle and pedestrian movement between East Somerville and the other neighborhoods. Would that be where the community path runs? Is that what we're referring to? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure, but in, in, the bottom line is there's no plans to increase um, any of the crossings as part of this project. So if there's a specific location or something that you're thinking about, perhaps you can um, submit a comment as noted on screen and we can follow up and look if there's something specific that could be addressed, but there's not currently any changes to crossings. That sounds good. Um, the next question is actually a comment from Corey that I'll read. One could consider dedicated bus rapid transit or light, way, light rail right of way with connection continuing into Medford as a way to better facilitate flow and alleviate some of the concerns on impact to people coming from Medford. Thank you for that comment, Corey. We have noted it. Next up is David. Highly supportive of this effort, particularly, oh boy, particularly the extensive tree plantings. Is it possible to drop to one lane in each direction in most sections, given the drop in traffic volumes, especially if the ADT drops below 20K, which is where this is approaching? Um, there's more, but that's the gist of it. That's something we can continue to evaluate as we move forward. Uh, I don't think it's been feasible up to this point in the design, but something we'll continue to look at carefully yeah and we are you know we do still have bus stops along the way and you know so there's some other measures that may make keeping the two lanes desirable but we'll continue to evaluate thank you the next is from lynn slide 65 uh i think that was the refo crossing the blue dash looks like a multi-use path but i think it's the somerville slash cambridge border also, the slide should show the future ped bike ramp on the Summer Bridge property. Additionally, it would be great to make Rufo and Route 28 crosswalk into a pedestrian scramble with painted lines for peds and bikes. Thanks for that comment, Lynn. Uh, from Cole, are you planning a connection with the future Grand Junction path? Uh, looks like somebody's typing an answer in the chat now, so or in the Q and A box now. Yes, yeah, so uh, oh, I'm sorry, that was me typing. <laughs> Orange the back again. Um, yeah, so part as part of this project, we have looked at like those missing links and try to 
see where we can connect to other bike paths and pedestrian walkways and all. So we'll continue to do that as the design progresses and, and we'll we'll look at the future Grand Junction path. Thanks. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, the next question is from Corey. Uh, as someone new to one of the meetings, what does 25% design complete mean? What are the milestones we should expect going forward? Uh, so 25% is the first major milestone in our design. It's where we have complete plans, um, not complete as in nothing can change. They're just fully designed to a, a level where they can be reviewed. And we can start looking at environmental permitting and right of way and things like that. So uh, is 25, 75, and 100% are major milestones. Uh, and then the final PSNE is is the last step before we advertise the project for construction. So those will all be coming in the next few years. Um, we're hoping to get to 25% later this year. That's the goal. So. And after that, we'll have a design public hearing. Thank you, Chris. Next up from Andres, what kind of coordination is in place between the city and state if slash when adjustments need to be made and there are issues of jurisdiction? I'm thinking, for example, the light misalignment slash lane at the intersection of Highland, McGrath, and Medford Street. Andres, this is Brad from the city. Thanks for that question. So we do meet, gosh, weekly uh, with various parts of MassDOT to troubleshoot operational issues like the one you're describing. So I'll make sure to capture that note. But then in terms of the longer term design, um, we figure out, again, what pieces of the roadway and the signal infrastructure are fully under state jurisdiction or conversely, which ones are under local jurisdiction and just make sure that both parties have the same design and objectives. And I really do hope that folks feel with tonight's meeting that our interests and our design philosophy is aligned, pedestrian first, transit and bike second, motor vehicle third. Um, so all of that coordination will continue through the design development process uh, on intersections like the one you mentioned, Andres. So thank you. Thank you, Brad. The next question is from Holly. How often does the design team pass through this area in non-car modes of transit? So for transit, specifically public transportation, are we asking about? She said uh, non-car, so I think walking and biking would be good too. Uh, I don't pass through it frequently now. <laughs> I did when my wife lived in Somerville, uh, but that was several years ago. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the design team. Yeah, I, I think you know. I uh, I admittedly don't you know pass through this area with right on on regular basis, but you know we've all been out there walking the corridor, you know, in all different modes going through here to look at it and see what's going on and really get the feel for it. We have some folks that are current and former residents on our team you know, keeping us honest. And we have meetings like this so that, you know, we get the input and the feedback from those that do use it every day. Because quite honestly, even if I use it, I still only use it the way that I do and not the way that all the other users um, are experiencing it. And that's why we want the input from it. You know, I don't want a design that works for me. I want the design that works for the road users. So, you know, regardless of our use, it's really this input that informs the design and gives us that guidance. Thank you, Gary. The next question is from Lynn. The bike lane and cycle track on the Highland Ave Trust Bridge and Gilman Street Bridge must be raised and protected by a barrier. Friends of the community path and another requested this when the sidewalk was redone several years ago. This is not shown now in the cross section. It's a very fast moving and dangerous area for cyclists. So please make this a raised and protected cycle track on both sides. Thank you, Lynn, for that comment. Uh, the next question is from Zev. Regarding Dana Street and Edmond Street, can the intersections consider adding paint to indicate potential cycling movements from neighbor ways to the boulevard? This would add to the network connectivity of the street. 
Is that this is Brad from the city? Thanks for that comment. I'll capture that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the city does work like that in our neighborways throughout Somerville. And we're currently working on design standards so that you have much more predictability about those types of intersection treatments you mentioned at Dana and Edmonds. So thank you. And finally, from Joel, this question says there are level of traffic stress when crossings shown. Um, I'm not quite sure what this is referring to. Maybe an earlier question that he asked. Well, yeah, I think we had discussed about there were level of stress two that might have been because of intersection crossings, but it also shows level of stress one crossings. I see. Okay. Glad we yeah. cleared that up. Uh, I might have heard someone wanting to contribute. No, I was just going to say, I wonder if their question was like, what is the difference? Like, is level of stress one one of the, is it related to the number of cars on the side street or level of protection? But um, I think just acknowledging that every intersection is different is probably fine. Yeah, I All think right. those green ones are not crossings. They're just right That's in, right out intersections. Right. Something about the exposure, I think, in the methodology. Yeah. We did it. Mm -hmm. Yep. With that, I'm going to take us to our ending slide. Thanks for sticking with us. And I'll turn it back to Chris to close us out. Thank you, Leah. Thank you all for attending and for your uh, thoughtful questions and comments. Time is now 9.13 p.m. and this meeting is officially closed. Thank you all for coming.